Recording in progress. Recording stopped.
Good morning, uh, honorable members. All on parties. Ninja Molo Davis is a good child. Zabil Manyamza, eh, Molen Molen Chan in Jandat Olamcha. I need to try and sort out my sound. I don't seem to hear anything. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Chen. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. I All think. Right. Uh, Are there any apologies on your side? Thank you, Chen. From my side, I've got the apology from Umamu Kriet. Ukriet, Utamamu Kriet is not available for this meeting today due to other commitments. And then Umamu Papama Che is going to log in just to listen, but she's not going to speak. She's not feeling well. And UTM Kwacha Che is attending stakeholder engagement in Emalasheni. UTM Kapayana Che is visiting one of the local municipalities in the Northwest province. That's all from my side, Che. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manyams, any apologies on your side? No apologies, Che. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable members, are there any further apologies on your side before we get underway? If no further apologies, honorable members, allow me to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Portfolio Committee meeting on agricultural land reform and rural development want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, the Honorable Minister as well as uh, the Deputy Minister and the officials of the department. Um, let me simply say Molweni, good morning, Huyamore, Dumela, we start uh, honorable meetings, uh, this meeting with greetings of peace to all. We trust that this morning's session will, call be, will be constructive and fruitful. This morning's portfolio committee meeting's agenda is as follows. We will be uh, having a briefing from the Department of Agriculture and Reform on the framework and implementation of the Spatial Plan Planning and Use Management Act, known as SPLUMA. We also, honorable members, will be having a briefing from SALGA on SPLUMA's implementation challenges and pathways to a better spatial planning and land use management in SA. Honorable members, Chapter 8 of the NDP calls for preparation of National Spatial Development Framework to be reviewed in every five years. Section 5, subsection 3A, and sections 13, subsection 1 and 2 of SPLUMA man mandate the minister to after consultation with other organs of state and with public to compile and publish a national spatial development framework. In according with SPLUMA honorable members, the NSDF must within the broader family of strategic and sector plans of government, target and direct all infrastructure investment and development spending decisions by the national sector departments and state-owned entities. Also guide and align plan preparation, budgeting, implementation, 
across spheres and between sectors of government to frame and coordinate provincial, regional, and municipal spatial development frameworks. Honorable members, the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality have their foundations firmly rooted in the apartheid era. Practices, policies, and all legislation. The apartheid regime's economy was deliberately structured as a non inclusive discriminating against blacks in general. I should, honorable members, also remark that inequality manifests in class apart from race. It also has a gender and spatial dimension, and so are both unemployment and poverty. International programs that intervene to create spatial inclusive society it can make a difference. We all know, honorable members, that land use planning has been a subject of much debate and controversy since 1995, resulting in the Constitutional Court pronouncing that planning is an exclusive municipal function assigned by Section 156, subsection 1 of the Constitution. It is for that reason that the special planning and land use management, commonly known as SPLUMA, was passed into law in 2013 to address the legacy of spatial injustice, which I've mentioned above. Amongst other issues, honorable members, SPLUMA 621 provide a framework for special planning and land use management to, to provide for the inclusive, developmental, equitable, and efficient special planning at the different spheres of government. And three, to provide a framework for the monitoring, coordination, and review of the special planning and land use management system. Today's presentations, honorable members, by the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development, as well as that of South African Local Government Association, known as SALCA, presents us with an opportunity as a committee uh, to have an extension, uh, as an extension of the National Assembly to assess progress made by government to address the apartheid legacy of spatial inequality. Monitoring the implementation of framework legislation tends to focus on ticking boxes regarding compliance to legislation and or regulations. However, honorable members, presentations by both the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development and that of SALCA creates an opportunity for a wider focus. It allows us as the committee to oversee implementation of provisions of legislation and learn from SALGA, whose current strategy includes the promotion of spatial inclus inclusion and related economic transformation on how SPLUMA has facilitated spatial transformation in the Republic of South Africa. We are therefore particularly interested in how SPLUMA in progress. related by laws, municipality, municipal planning tribunals, training and capacity building programs, as well as special development frameworks in their varieties, contributed to the breaking of the damaging spatial patterns which man, marginalized black majority to the outskirts of the cities, and the marginal former homelands previously referred to as Bantu states. So we are asking whether implementation of SPLUMA, which came into operation in July 2015, which was eight years ago, is breaking the special legacy of apartheid. Given the limited time, this is how we will proceed. We will, honorable members, take the presentation from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, 
and rural development, which will be immediately followed by the SALGA presentation. After the two presentations, honorable members, we can then pose questions uh, to the presenters, indicating to whom a question is or the questions are directed to. While special planning is a critical facet of the transformation that we need to effect as a nation, we must all be seized by the task of transformation of the structure of the economy. This task is of necessity a function of government, private sector, and civil society working together to provide access to the mainstream economy and changing the patterns of ownership. Honorable members, government alone, alone cannot succeed in distributing uh, of wealth, spatial development, and planning is but one such instrument to give uh, effect to creating an enabling environment for fundamental transformation and to give effect to the constitutional imperative that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black or white. Allow me, therefore, honorable members, to take this opportunity to invite the executive, the honorable minister, Mahmoud Titiza, and the officials of the department to present uh, before the committee, which will be followed by Salka. Honorable Minister, you may proceed. Good morning, uh, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Ngozu Mandela. Good morning to members of the Portfolio Committee present, senior officials, as well as Salka representative present here. The background that you have given, uh, Chairperson, I think is comprehensive enough, and it would allow us to then make a presentation to say, how have we dealt with the implementation of Spluma? And uh, I would therefore not waste time, but rather ask DDG Clinton Heyman to actually lead the presentation with uh, the team. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Um, good morning, Honourable Members. Good morning, Minister, Deputy Ministers, and DG. Um, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Rajesh Makan, who is the really the custodian of driving um, Spluma within my branch, to take you briefly through a presentation. There is a lot of detail. And um, Rajesh, are you ready? Yes, uh, thank you, DG. Okay, I you. am. I just want to check, is Ralph, are you going to share the presentation or should I share it on my side? Uh, before we start, uh, just good morning to the Honourable Chair of the Portfolio Committee, uh, to Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, DG uh, and uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm going to quickly take you through the presentation that we have prepared. I think uh, Honourable Chair has given a lot of detail about uh, the spluma and the background, so I'll I will try and skip over some of that. But just in terms of the structure of the presentation, uh, just to quickly touch on the journey that the chair has spoken about, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, fundamentally, I think what uh, is important to highlight is the changes that were introduced by spluma to deal with some of the challenges that was inherited uh, from the pre-1994 regime. Uh, just to talk about the the framework that the Spluma presents uh, as uh, a legislation, uh, then an overview of implementation progress. I think the chair has mentioned that we almost eight years, I think in June will be nine years uh, in the implementation of the Spluma. So just to give you a sense of uh, what the implementation progress is across the country. Uh, importantly, the chair, honorable chair also touched on the national spatial development framework. So we'll just give you a quick, quick overview of uh, the NSTF uh, and its mandate. Uh, then to touch on the some of the work that we have been doing as a department around Spluma implementation support, uh, and to wrap up and touch on challenges and then conclusion. 
So that's just an overview of what we will be taking you through. I think in terms of this slide, uh, and I think the Honorable Chair has done a lot of justice to this one, we all know that in uh, pre-1994, uh, we had uh, a system that was planned and designed to serve a different political ideal uh, around segregation. We had multiple laws, multiple institutions. In 1995, uh, just post uh, the coming in of the first democratic uh, government, uh, we inherited uh, that very in uh, complex and disjointed uh, planning system. 1995, there was an attempt uh, to address uh, some of uh, the challenges through the development of the Development Facilitation Act, which was the first and very first uh, post-apartheid legislation that was always promulgated as an interim measure to deal with the apartheid spatial legacy. I think during the 2000s and 2001 period, we saw a lot of local government uh, legislation that was put in place to to guide uh, how our local government sphere would work. We had the Municipal Structures Act, the Municipal Systems Act, and importantly, we also had the white paper on spatial planning and land use management. And, and that uh, legislation or policy uh, set out a framework and it always envisaged that we would at some point have a national legislation, uh, but we'll get into those details later. In June 2010, and I think the Honorable Chair touched on it, there was a very important judgment by the Constitutional Court uh, around Chapters 5 and 6 of the Development Facilitation Act, uh, which found uh, those particular chapters to be unconstitutional and, and then triggered the need for uh, and an urgent need for new national planning legislation. Just a little background about that particular case. Uh, in terms of the Development Facilitation Act, uh, the Act gave powers to provinces. So, so we had uh, what we call development tribunals at provincial level uh, that used to take land use decisions. And the matter arose from a... Uh, application that was in the area of, I think you all know, the our waterfall is now actually developing very quickly in Madran, but the matter was actually there in that space. Uh, and where the city of Joburg took the Gauteng Development Tribunal uh, to court on a decision they had taken in that particular space. And the outcome finally in 2010 was that uh, chapters 5 and 6, uh, which dealt with the matters around uh, the powers and functions of uh, the uh, provincial uh, tribunals. Uh, and, and, they, and, and it reconfirmed uh, that the function of municipal planning lies within the municipal sphere. And I think that has then informed uh, what we have in developed in terms of a framework legislation in terms of the Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act, uh, as we all know, uh, in Spluma, which was passed in 2013. Uh, in 2014-15, we did a lot of work as a department in ensuring that municipalities were ready to implement the act. Uh, and we, we developed uh, many tools, guidelines. Uh, we even did assessments uh, of the capability of municipalities to and uh, for their readiness to implement the spluma, uh, and post that the spluma was then brought into operation in June 2015, uh, together with a set of uh, regulations uh, which was passed in August of the same year. Uh, so June 2020 was our first, uh, I would say, milestone in terms of deadlines around compliance. Uh, where municipalities for the first time had to develop uh, land use schemes for the entire space. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some municipalities were not able to meet that deadline, but working together uh, with our colleagues, and I know Salga is in the room, so we work very closely with them and with our provincial counterparts uh, of cooperative governance uh, to ensure that municipalities were able to meet that deadline uh, which was extended to June 2022. And we'll just give you an overview of what progress is on that. And we are now in February 2014. And, and next year, June 2025, will be 10 years. Uh, uh, so we plan some activities around understanding what we have achieved in those 10 years. 
I think I've spoken a lot about the constitutional court judgment, so I won't get into the detail. But I think what is important is the second point is that the court held that the powers to consider and approve applications for rezoning of land and establishment of uh, townships were elements of municipal planning and are a exclusive municipal function. So I think that's a very important point. Uh, and as I've indicated, the Spluma then responded to that particular judgment and its framework legislation. Uh, in terms of uh, the focus of what we have been doing around Spluma uh, and ensuring that we are able to monitor its implementation and also support uh, provinces and municipalities where necessary. Uh, what we've done is we've developed customized uh, model bylaws uh, for municipalities. We've assisted in the establishment of municipal uh, planning tribunals. We've assisted where we can around development of delegations uh, tariffs. Uh, capacity building has been an important pillar of our support that we have been providing to municipalities. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And importantly, we have for the first time in the country, uh, a national spatial development framework that has been adopted by cabinet and gazetted uh, by our minister. Uh, so it's actually a milestone for the country in terms of our efforts to address our spatial transformation challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Now, just to quickly touch on uh, the changes that were introduced by uh, the Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act and these uh, these seven critical changes uh, that it brought about in the planning system. And the first one, I think I've spoken a lot about, it is about the reiteration of the sole mandate of municipalities around municipal planning. So land development, land use management uh, remains a core responsibility of municipalities. Uh, I think importantly, it was also trying to get rid of uh, the parallel and uh, multiple legislation that still existed. It took a while to get the honorable members, but I think we are we are almost there. Uh, in terms of uh, land use regulators, importantly, uh, was the establishment of municipal planning tribunals, uh, which uh, we've made different types uh, available depending on uh, a municipal. So a municipality can have its own municipal planning tribunal. It can agree with a adjoining municipality or two municipalities to have a joint municipal planning tribunal. And it can have a district uh, municipal planning tribunal uh, that is run from a district level. And, and why we did this, honorable members, is that uh, to take into consideration that in certain parts of the country, capacity and in specifically planning capacity is a challenge. Uh, and we then also uh, brought in uh, appeal structures uh, that are run by uh, municipalities. I think importantly was the development of inclusive land use schemes uh, for the first time again, I think, uh, from uh, Spluma, or, uh, post uh, the passing of Spluma, municipalities had to develop what we call back-to-back -back land use schemes. So for the first time, it was a requirement to have a land use scheme that covered the entire jurisdiction of your municipality. And, and that was never the case before. Uh, I think honorable members will know that before we had land use schemes just covering the urban spaces. So for example, in uh, in Gauteng, you would have one for Gauda, for Joburg, you've had one for Midran, uh, you've had one for all those different cities before. But for the first time now, they had to develop a comprehensive, inclusive and back-to-back -back land use scheme that covered all spaces, both urban and rural. I think importantly, uh, is the introduction uh, and reconfirmation of spatial development frameworks. Uh, I am saying reconfirmation. The Municipal uh, Systems Act from 2001 always had the issue of an STF as part of an IDP. So we reconfirmed it, but also elevated the role of an STF to a more strategic nature on a, on a, to plan on a longer term. I think we've also then uh, made provision for provincial spatial development frameworks and the national one, which we again will will talk to. And importantly, I think number five is 
something that we've never had before is a regional spatial development framework. And a regional spatial development framework, honorable members, uh, would cover a particular region in the country uh, that has very particular either economic, environmental, or any other related challenges. And it can cross the boundaries of provinces uh, and municipalities. We have about four of them that we are currently busy with. I think importantly, it also ensured that uh, we strengthened our Indian governmental support, uh, not only about enforcement. Enforcement is important, compliance, and then it's also about how we support provinces and municipalities. And lastly, uh, alignment, it introduced uh, alignment of authorization processes. So we, we create a system that uh, allows a better alignment of authorizations between land development, environmental matters, etc. Uh, next slide, please. So, so those were the seven changes. Now to quickly touch on the framework that is created by, by Spluma. Uh, and if you look at the extreme uh, left of this uh, diagram, it just shows the power of uh, the minister in terms of Spluma. So minister has uh, the powers to support and monitor. And, and, and we do a lot of our work through using Section 9, particularly in terms of our support to municipalities, and not only municipalities, but also provinces where necessary. I think Section 13 and 14 speaks about the National Spatial Development Framework, and I'll speak to it later in the presentation. I've touched on the issue of the Regional Spatial Development Framework. Section 52, National Interest, uh, we have been cautioned a little bit about this, uh, about the possibility of it being unconstitutional, uh, where minister can intervene uh, in particular applications. Minister has the right to do regulations in terms of Section 54. And importantly, uh, minister in terms of Section 55 can exempt in certain cases, and uh, these cases can either be presented by a province or a municipality, to be exempted from any provision of this pluma. Uh, we have done, I think, uh, at, uh, currently we minister has only passed one uh, that was in KZN, but we haven't received any other requests for exemptions. Uh, and then there's uh, the issue of delegations. Then at the core of uh, the legislation, uh, that's chapters four, five, and six, deal with your spatial planning and land uh, development matters. So chapter four guides uh, the different levels of spatial development frameworks. Uh, chapter five, importantly, is around land use schemes uh, and gives the detail about how municipalities should develop uh, these back-to-back uh, -back land use schemes. And chapter six is about your land development manage, uh, management. So how do you uh, establish your municipal planning tribunals and your appeal structures uh, and then sections 10 uh, 15 16 and uh, deal with the province the powers of provinces so they can develop their own provincial legislation interestingly there's only one province that has developed uh, i would call it post spluma provincial legislation and that's the western cape uh, they have a Planning and Development Act. There's other provinces that are in the process uh, and they are at varying stages. Uh, and then uh, at the bottom uh, right hand corner, it just talks about the powers of local government and land development. And and I think what is important is that Spluma is framework legislation, honorable members. Uh, it does not in itself create new laws concerning spatial planning. But what it does it gives local municipalities the power to create uh, their own legislation around spatial planning and land use management to deal with the actual details on how they deal uh, with those processes. Uh, next slide, please. Now, just to quickly touch on progress, uh, and this is, uh, we do this as a department uh, on a quarterly basis, we keep updated information uh, we also in the process of updating a system that uh, will allow us to gather this and uh, monitor this information easily or much more easily. So the first uh, area is the uh, uh, development of 
bylaws by municipalities. Remember, honorable members, that without a bylaw, a municipality is not able to process a land development application. So on this front, I think we are 100% compliant. So all municipalities now have uh, the their bylaws. I think as a department, uh, and uh, just after the passing of this pluma, we developed model bylaws for six provinces, and and a lot of the municipalities in those provinces use that as a basis to then customize and generate their own uh, municipal uh, bylaws. Uh, next slide, please. I think the next one is around the land use schemes, and I spoke about this. Uh, we had a, the deadline extended by twenty four months from June. 2020, to date, honorable members, we have 87% compliance uh, and we have 12%, uh, so that uh, is about 26 municipalities that are currently reviewing. And there's two municipalities that are now in the very early stages of the land use scheme development. Uh, that's uh, Inok Gijima and Madibeng. And uh, we are actually funding uh, the development of this land use scheme. Uh, now, there are different reasons as to why they are not compliant uh, relating to capacity, relating to funding. Uh, but uh, we have worked very closely with our colleagues in Salga and provinces to get to this point. Uh, and, and, and I think it's it's definitely progress. Uh, and and we, we are hoping that... Uh, the outstanding or the ones that are under review or just starting off will be done uh, in the next uh, financial year. Uh, next slide. Uh, spatial development frameworks. Uh, and again, I think honorable members don't be too uh, worried about the under review. I think in terms of the spluma, a municipality has to review its spatial development framework every five years. So many of the municipalities across the country are now uh, undertaking that particular review. Uh, we have those that have completed. So 51% of municipalities are compliant, 48% are under review. And, and we have one municipality in the Eastern Cape that we're working or trying to work with uh, to get them to review the spatial development framework. Uh, and again, I think as a department, we have stepped in uh, with funding in terms of Section 9, where municipalities are not able to fund the review of the spatial development frameworks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, establishment of municipal uh, planning tribunals. And again, uh, I think there's good progress is 96% have been established. Uh, they are those that have had... Uh, Administrative challenges, the ones in the free state uh, in particular, uh, are some of those municipalities that are under administration. Uh, so it makes it difficult for them to then reestablish the municipal planning tribunals. But we are working closely with those, uh, especially uh, in the red and, and the yellow spaces to see how we can assist. Uh, just to say that we also get down to support at a level where uh, if necessary, we pay for gazette notices uh, like we have paid for some in the Eastern Cape where municipalities don't have money to gazette uh, the municipal planning tribunals and we get down to that level of support through our provincial offices. Uh, next slide, please. The authorized official, uh, again, I think there's 99% have authorized officials. There's two municipalities, one in Northwest and one in Eastern Cape, uh, so Kakisano, Molopo, and Nkusa Hills uh, that don't have an uh, authorized official. But again, I just want to uh, emphasize the point that the appointment of an authorized authorized official is not compulsory because the Spluma says may. Uh, I think the authorized official just makes the work of the municipal planning tribunal easier because a municipality can then decide to appoint a professional planner who is able to look at certain categories of, of uh, uh, land development applications. Uh, and those are mainly your, your minor uh, land development applications that usually go to an authorized official who can then uh, take a decision on that. 
uh, guided by the spatial development framework and the land use scheme and the policies and bylaws of that particular municipality. Next slide, please. The tariffs and delegations, again, I think there's been good progress. We at 97%. There are those few in the Eastern Cape that we are trying to work with uh, to try and finalize the delegations and tariffs. Again, I think this is a core function of a municipality uh, and, and our hands are a little tied because this uh, area just is uh, allows the municipality, for example, to publish rates for, like when you submit a land development application, how much would you pay for, in terms of an application fee, et cetera. So it varies a bit across uh, the different provinces and there's no standard. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Now the issue of non-compliance, and I think this is, uh, but just to emphasize uh, honorable members, honorable minister, that I think the work that we have been trying to do now is trying to get the system up and running. And I think we've got to a point where municipalities are now almost 100% compliant, their systems and processes are running. So, so we haven't really been dealing with uh, or trying to uh, come in from a point of addressing non-compliance with punitive measures, but rather support and assist. I think we are at a point where we now want to ensure that uh, we are able to get into the next phase of enforcement. Uh, and as indicated, we monitor compliance on a quarterly basis. Uh, I've also touched on the point that we now are developing. We've had a system that was developed in 2016. Unfortunately, it uh, for various reasons, we couldn't get it off the ground, but we're now enhancing that tool. Uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to help us to monitor this uh, on a, a more easily using technology uh, so that work is in progress in terms of some of the mechanisms we have at hand for addressing non-compliance uh, minister has in uh, the case of the land use schemes issued letters of non-compliance to municipalities and given them conditions to comply with including reporting uh, for example, to the department on progress on uh, the development of the land use schemes. We continue to support uh, from a financial uh, perspective, the development of land use schemes and review of spatial development frameworks. Our provincial offices works very closely uh, with the, the provincial counterparts and provincial SAGA offices to ensure that they are there to advise municipalities uh, in the case of the land use scheme, I've also touched on, we did then establish a, what we call a land use scheme task team at, uh, including uh, in national departments, provincial departments and SELGA, both at national and province, to try and address the issues around compliance. And I think that intergovernmental work that we do uh, really helps us and it really has helped us in, in achieving a lot of what we have in terms of the implementation of SMOA. I have also indicated that where necessary, we also give uh, municipality support by drafting pro forma notices to the councils uh, so that they are able to present some of the matters that they need to where they don't have the capacity uh, to get them uh, considered by council. And then we continue to develop and enhance some of the tools that we are developing uh, we, the, the last bullet, honorable members, uh, honorable chair, honorable minister, is about now ensuring that the uh, we now have land use schemes and spatial development framework. But what is the quality and of, of those particular instruments? Uh, we don't want to see them as simply a, text, a tick box exercise, but rather to look into the details around what are, what is the content of it. Are the instruments like your spatial development frameworks and land use uh, schemes are geared to addressing our spatial transformation challenges? And we're now getting into that more uh, qualitative assessment of those instruments. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of uh, the work that we want to do around the SPLUMA going forward, 
And I think we are at the stage, you know, Honourable Chair, Honourable Minister and Honourable Members to look at amendments to this Bloomer. Uh, I think we are going to be uh, nine years uh, into its implementation in uh, June 2024 and next year it's going to be 2025. So working together with our colleagues in provinces and local governments uh, and ensuring that we try and uh, oh, the one of the key objectives of Spluma is to promote spatial transformation through its principles and through lessons learned uh, from an operational perspective and a practice perspective, we have found that there are some shortcomings and uncertainties, uh, both in the act and the regulations. And this we have uh, taken some time to discuss these in our various engagements for us, both with provinces and municipalities. And, and we have identified what we would call a set of amendment areas that uh, we are in the process of unpacking and uh, rewriting in terms of possible amendments to this pluma. In terms of some of the areas, uh, they go down to your very minor details around amending certain definitions to be more clear. I think secondly, there are some constitutional matters. I spoke earlier about section 52 the national interests, uh, just to provide a little more clarity and to ensure that uh, we are clear on the constitutional mandates between the different spheres. Uh, I think uh, in some cases and some sections from a practice, practical perspective, there has been some challenges and we want to change that. I think importantly, uh, we want to improve the involvement and participation of the traditional and Khoisan leaders in spatial planning and land use management aspects. Uh, Honourable Chair, Honourable Minister, Honourable Members, uh, we are aware of the unhappiness or, or that uh, the institution of traditional leaders have raised with Spluma. So, so we, we're looking at ways of making them uh, more included and more inclusive in the Spluma. Uh, and, and that is an area that we are really doing some work on we, as a department, have also uh, we in the process of implementing what we call a land planning program that looks at planning. And I think there's a few pilots that have been identified, uh, but there's three pillars to it. One of the pillars of that particular program is to discuss uh, what are the possibilities and uh, within the constitutional framework to include uh, the institution of traditional leaders uh, in spatial planning and land use management matters. Uh, we've had uh, various engagements at a national level and across the provinces. We, we're now at a stage where we want to go down a, to a lower level, but before we go there, we want to go back to the National House and give them feedback and take some guidance on how we proceed on some of the matters. And also then to align uh, with other acts uh, that have been changing. Uh, so, so those are the areas that we've identified. And in terms of the regulations, uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Minister, Honorable Members, uh, there are certain areas that we want to uh, now regulate on uh, and provide a little more detail, which we have not uh, previously done. Uh, next slide. Then uh, moving on to the National Spatial Development Framework now as part of the implementation of SPLUMA and for the first time in legislation in the country, uh, we have a National Spatial Development Framework that has been developed and approved in terms of legislation. The very first attempt at the development of a National Spatial Development Framework was as far back as 1996 by the RDP office uh, but it didn't really uh, find traction at that stage. But uh, importantly, we now have a instrument at national level that will help us to address some of our spatial transformation challenges. Uh, next slide. Now, in terms of the, the mandate and where do we get the mandate for the National Spatial Development Framework, I think the first uh, part of it comes from a uh, chapter eight of the National Development Plan. There is, or there has been a call in the National Development Plan for the development of a national spatial development framework. In terms of SLUMA, for the first time, it has introduced it uh, at the, the level of making it a requirement in terms of law. 
so the minister has the power after consultation uh, with both uh, the three spheres of government, the public uh, and civil society to, to compile and publish a national spatial development framework. And importantly, I think what this national spatial development framework attempts to do or is going to assist us with, I think, is to target and direct infrastructure investment. Uh, and I think importantly, development spending, not only by national sector departments, by, by also the state-owned entities. Infrastructure investment is critical, I think, to addressing some of the challenges that we currently face. I think importantly, it's also there to guide and align and better integrate uh, the different plans that we have across government, You'd see in the diagram on the left, from the national, provincial, regional to local level, you have a number of instruments and the NSDF brings in a both not only vertical, but also horizontal alignment uh, and brings all of these plans together in one national plan. Uh, and I think that is what is captured in the last point. It also then frames and coordinates the different levels of spatial development frameworks. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, quickly to talk about the content, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but just to give you an uh, insight of, into what the National Spatial Development uh, Framework contains. So it's broken up into seven sections. The first part, uh, and we've introduced what we call a theory of change. Uh, that underpins the the uh, the thrust and the content of this national spatial development framework, and and it proposes uh, intervention in national space around it the national spatial development logic, and importantly our spatial patterns, uh, our natural resources, our patterns of ownership of access to land and other resources. Chapter two quickly. Is an overview of the process. We started this process uh, in 2015-2016 uh, where we did some research, we had some thematic reports and which eventually culminated in the product that we have and that was passed by cabinet in, in 2022 uh, and gazetted by minister in February 2023. So, so it was a long-term uh, work and we worked very closely across government, across and with civil society. And uh, we also had the NPC uh, helping us uh, with civil society engagements. Uh, chapter three speaks about the national spatial development shapers and basically the shapers are the opportunities and challenges that we have from a spatial perspective in the country. And we have 11 of those. Uh, chapter four, introduces uh, the first vision that we have from a spatial perspective. Chapter eight of the National Development Plan again also asks for a, uh, a vision statement. And uh, this uh, is then introduced in uh, part four of the document. Part five is the core of the National Spatial Development Framework. Uh, it introduces the ideal post-apartheid spatial development pattern. Uh, in a main frame that is uh, supported by five subframes, but importantly, it brings in uh, five types of national spatial action areas. So we have five types, uh, and we have thirteen spaces in the country where the NSDF identifies particular interventions that needs to uh, to take place, and uh, we are currently. Honorable Chair, Honorable Minister, Honorable Members, working closely with the DPME. Uh, there's a meeting on Friday where we want to see how we bring this National Spatial Action Areas closer to the work that is being done by DPME in developing the next medium-term development plan, so the next five-year plan for government uh, post the election. So, so it's critical that we bring that body of work closer to the to the M MTDP. Uh, I think honourable members may know it as the MTSF. It's now going to be called the Medium Term Development Plan. Then Chapter Six uh, talks about the implementation framework and the conclusion. So that's just a high level overview of what is in the NSDF. Uh, next slide. 
Now to touch on some of the work that we've been doing as a department in supporting uh, municipalities, and I've uh, already spoken to a lot of this, so we've developed remodel bylaws. We have uh, supported financially uh, 45 municipalities to develop the land use scheme and 36 municipalities to develop and review the spatial development framework frameworks and uh, this is ongoing support i know we also in the next financial year there's a few municipalities that have approached the department to assist them uh, to do, uh, review their spatial development framework so honorable chair honorable minister honorable member this is ongoing work and and we will continue to to support where we can uh, the table is just a high level overview of some of the work i've spoken to a lot of it but maybe I just want to focus on uh, the these two or three areas that I haven't spoken to. I think the one area where we have reaped a lot of success uh, and bringing government together is through our national spatial planning forums. So we have a national spatial planning forum, and the focus of that forum has changed over the years. I think before and as we started implementing SPLUMA, we were talking a lot more about how we can, as a collective, support municipalities to implement this Pluma. And now that Pluma implementation is maturing, this Pluma forum discussions are also changing to adapt to uh, oh, what are some of the challenges that we currently face around technology, AI, climate change. So, so these discussion forums really help us, I think, as a department to bring our stakeholders uh, together I think the training and capacity is an ongoing initiative. We will continue to provide that training and capacity. And again, I must mention that we work closely with our colleagues, uh, with Salga, on that. We are currently uh, in, uh, have just started some work around uh, bringing some innovation in the way we make this training and capacity building uh, materials available. Uh, we're developing a tool. Uh, and uh, we're looking at developing applications that uh, municipal councillors, municipal officials can download on their phone uh, and do some self-learning, so online courses. And and, and we're looking, uh, that is a more of a, a two or three year project, but we're starting with that. I think it's important that we have that uh, support where municipalities can then go to a website, uh, download a course, uh, or have a platform where they can ask us questions. So that is the work that we are we are, uh, we are doing there. I think importantly, we also, uh, Honorable Minister is also responsible for the Planning Profession Act. And we work closely with the South African Council for Planners to ensure that we are also uh, training uh, planners who are able to adapt and adjust to the current challenges. I think I've mentioned climate change, uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence, and uh, to deal with some of the capacity issues uh, around planning. Uh, so we we have just recently appointed a new CEO for minister has appointed a new CEO for SACPLAN. So so we're working closely with them to see how we can deal with the matters of particularly planning capacity at municipal level. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a overview of some of the instruments, the support tools that we have in place, so guidelines. Uh, the picture on the extreme right shows some of the training that we have been doing. Training has been uh, ongoing, and we've also worked closely with Selga, both at national and province, in uh, providing this training. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, now some of, yeah, if, now we need to talk about the challenges. Uh, although we've spoken about uh, the positives, there's always challenges that uh, we have to work around. Uh, and we've identified a few of, of those. Uh, the, the first one is about the lack of capacity at local government. And in some cases, the urgency to prioritize spatial planning and land use management issues. And, and why we say that is that municipalities understand that in terms of the law, they need to develop uh, spatial development frameworks, they need to develop land use schemes. 
uh, but we find that uh, they unfortunately don't budget for those type of instruments. Uh, and, and that is where we have to step in as a department. But again, I think we, we continue to work with SACPLAN uh, to address some of the issues around capacity building uh, at local government and particularly planners. Uh, we have uh, developed an app and we have identified, for example, where we have uh, 184 planners who have completed their, uh, their degrees or diplomas or whatever qualification they may have and who are currently unemployed. And we, through the development of that app and which we administered through the SAC plan and, and other medium, we now know exactly where they are in the country and we we're working together with SACPLAN to see how we can bring those, that capacity that is out there uh, to address some of the capacity challenges. Uh, I think uh, there's a complexity around it, around funding, et cetera, uh, which we are trying to work around. Uh, I think I've spoken a lot about the funding uh, and the human resource challenges. I think the third bullet is about the instability in uh, land use regulators or municipalities in in some cases are unable to pay for uh, the sittings of your municipal planning tribunal uh, and because of that they are unable to process land development applications in some cases there has been amalgamation of some municipalities and that means that those municipalities have had to start from scratch again in developing uh, all of the instruments and policies that are required by the spluma uh, I think uh, the issue of the traditional institution, we are working very closely with them and trying to find solutions uh, to address their concerns. And as I've indicated, in, make sure that we include them uh, in, uh, in this pluma. I think the issue of uh, legal challenges, there has been uh, some, uh, I think, two court cases around, particularly Section 36 uh, here in the Western Cape, uh, around the exclusion of municipal councillors of on municipal planning tribunals. So uh, there was a case in Greenpoint and there was a case in Camps Bay uh, where Section 36.2 of the Spluma was challenged uh, and where the argument is that municipal councillors should form part of your municipal planning tribunals. Uh, those matters, uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, did not uh, go through the entire legal proceedings because they were always secondary matters to the main application. The main application was about a decision uh, taken um, on a land development application. And in both cases, uh, the applicant then decided to drop this particular matter. Uh, but it's something that we expect may come up again. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and in conclusion, Honorable Chair, Honorable Minister, Honorable Members, we continue as a department to support municipalities. And as I've indicated, we have been working uh, at ensuring compliance with the Act, and, and we want to then move away with that. And uh, I think that the, the significant strides that have been made uh, by the department is... Uh, as a result of working very closely with our provincial colleagues and also our colleagues from Selga who are in this meeting. Uh, so, Chair, I think that was my last slide. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair, Honourable Minister, Honourable Members. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, any further input from the department? No, thank you, Chair. But from my side. All right. Thank you, uh, Clinton. Honorable members, that is the presentation from the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development on SPLUMA. We will now immediately take the presentation from uh, Salga. You may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Chairperson of the Committee, Mandela Mandela, 
members of the parliamentary committee, Honorable Minister Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development, Metrogo Didiza, Senior officials of Dalrat, and all protocol observed. My name is Neil George Masek, the chairperson of uh, Rural Development and uh, and um, and planning in South, represented your South. So, Chair, I'm with the team. Mine is just to thank the committee for inviting Salga to come and make the input in today's proceedings. Chairperson and members of the committee, let me start by confirming that the committee invited Salga to present a report on its programs, projects, monitor and support special planning, land use management across municipalities in South Africa, with particular focus on driving spatial transformation that is so essential to drive economic and social transformation. Our National Executive Committee program of action contained in the organization's strategy for 2022, 2020 to 2027, identified the need to support municipalities to promote spatial inclusion and related economic transfers. The annual performance plans then provide for the implementation of a spatial transformation barometer program as one of the mechanisms to achieve the above strategic objective. Salga recognized that South Africa has a long history of social and economic exclusionary interventions that were underpinned by systematic spatial planning policies. Consequently, the inherited and currently dominant spatial form in many of our municipalities undermines the ability to progressively realize spatial transformation that ensures shared development opportunity, inclusive growth and a just transition. We therefore need to be intentional in reversing this fragmentation using SPLUMA as one of our key interventions. We then monitor progress on this through our spatial transformation barometer. Chairperson, we hope that our presentation will serve to share with the committee the key highlights of the SALGA spatial transformation barometer report findings. Two, to help in enhancing the community oversight on the implementation of spatial planning and land use management. Three, to share Salga's perspective on what and how South African municipalities are doing in promoting spatial transformation that seeks to move away from the country's inherited, segregated, unequal, unjust, fragmented, and sustainable settlement patterns. To also share the highlights on the work that some municipalities are pursuing to achieve spatial integration an economic uh, transformation within their respective areas of jurisdiction. Chairperson, please allow me to request our technical team, led by the portfolio head for the built environment, Mr. Siane Kashe, to present the technical details. The presentation will be delivered by Mr. Zano Tolo Futo, the senior manager responsible for planning and rural development. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson. Um, Honorable Chairperson of the Committee and Honorable Minister and the members of the Committee, um, allow me to align myself with the protocol that has been observed. My name is Zanoko Lofutwa. Um, may I request that the presentation is um, put up um, for Salga so that I can quickly go through it. I 
<clears throat> Are we allowed to share and drives? Thank you, Chair. I can share from our side if um, indicate um, if the presentation is visible. Thank you very much. Yes, Chair, the, the presentation is... is visible. Can you put it on slideshow? Thank you. The starting point for us is that we view Spluma as a very critical um, um, tool and a piece of legislation for um, managing and also guiding spatial transformation in municipalities. And um, it is also um, a tool that um, will help us to transform and also to be able to achieve the objectives of um, orderly development in our municipal areas. Um, we have engaged with um, different partners that operate in our municipalities um, and that have different roles with regards to land development matters, including um, the government, um, provincial and national spheres, the institution of traditional leadership. And we constantly um, 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 engage to deal with any matters and any conflict that requires um, resolution in enabling municipalities to be able to implement SPLUMA and to implement the orderly development objectives. And we are aware of the <clears throat> challenges that have emanated from both the relationship between our municipal councils, the structures that support municipal council to implement SPLUMA, um, such as uh, municipal planning tribunals, as well as institutions and the role of the institution of traditional leaderships in certain parts of the country. And as a result, we have put up a framework that should assist municipalities and traditional institutions to deal with conflict resolution at that level. We signed a national memorandum of agreement with the National House of Traditional Leadership and Coison, um, as well as the Department of um, Traditional Affairs to help guide how resolution must be. Um, how we resolve those conflict areas and concerns that are raised um, in the implementation of SPLUMA. Chairperson, I think from the onset, we must also express the appreciation that we have observed in the engagement through these stakeholders. That one, despite the series of concerns that were raised by the institutions of traditional leadership um, in the various provinces um, um, that have um, strong presence, um, we have seen improvements with regards to cooperation and understanding, and that there is a um, 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 common buy-in to the commitments that we have made at the May 2022 National Summit on Communal Land, as well as the September 2022 State of Local Government Summit, which resolved, among others, um, two common resolutions. One was to amend certain aspects of SPLUMA in order to deal with the concerns that were raised. And those concerns are about the structures and the relationship as well as the manner of cooperation in those structures. And, and I think we are working closely with the department as well as the stakeholders to work through those things. And I believe that through the final processing of the SPLUMA amendment, we should be able to address some of the concerns that were driving the concern, that were driving the, the the difficulties. And um, we've seen a lot of invitation that has been improved through the work that we've done in expanding the training and capacity building that we had initially designed for councillors to include um, members of the traditional houses in the areas where we take the training so that we are able to ensure that we share information, we share skills, um, and also we share advices from stakeholders on how we can better cooperation with regards to introducing wall-to-wall -wall land use schemes. And this has been accepted in quite a number of areas as a result of some of those of creating that space for cooperation and for dealing with issues around intergovernmental cooperation, particularly in rural governance and land governance. Um, Chaperson's Pluma is indeed a, 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 a piece of legislation that um, 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 should continue to assist us as one of the tools. 
particularly in achieving spatial transformation and enhancing the idea of a coherent singular planning system in the country, um, as well as facilitating the type of development that we desire to ensure core development, to ensure inclusion, and to ensure that we are able to have integrated settlements and integrated areas of development that take into account the supporting mechanisms in mobility, as well as the lifestyles that we want our citizens to enjoy under the democratic dispensation in South Africa. So this is a, a, a tool that in our observation um, um, is a useful tool for that. What we have done, Chairperson, in order to respond to the request that we have been asked to do by the committee, we have a program that we use to gather data to help us have scientific means of monitoring spatial transformation in municipalities. And that program is called the Spatial Transformation Barometer. And this is the program that Chairperson, um, we use to help us to achieve the understanding of the changes that are happening in space as a result of the investment that municipalities are making and investment that our policy and legal framework reforms are having or impacting. Um, the barometer itself <clears throat> is helping us Chairperson, to deal with these problems. One, the observation that we have picked that there is continuous fragmentation of space as a result of the manner in which we lay out interventions and that structure space, such as large infrastructure development programs and human settlements and programs, um, as well as um, economic coordination programs. If you look at the slide, Chairperson, um, it indicates, for example, in the eastern part of the country, um, 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 the darker the dots are uh, the indication of areas that are highly um, um, fragmented and with low densities, which makes it difficult for achieving concentrated development, as well as enabling support in the form of services that needs to be laid out, economic activity that needs to be meaningful in those areas. Um, and this is across urban and rural spaces. If you look at the right bottom one, it indicates from an aerial perspective um, what um, and we, are, we, are, we are seeing from our municipalities. However, we do feel that there is potential in applying instruments such as SPLUMA to try and deal with that, particularly where these instruments are applied correctly. And this is just one example in which in a project that is designed within the scope of a municipal spatial development framework and the regulatory input of the land use scheme, we can be able to achieve integration integration as indicated in the picture on top there. But also we have observed Chairperson that there is there are challenges that if not monitored very well could create perpetration of the problem we are trying to resolve um, in space by allowing decisions on land developments that continue to disintegrate and to disable the opportunity for social integration by creating clever means that developers often follow when they submit these plans, where you put um, classes of income level um, development, particularly in human settlements projects, that continue to send people that are poor or that are seen as um, having less value development away from centers of opportunity, um, which is the typical example that is um, referring in a municipality at the bottom. 
And sometimes these are using very clever um, tools within the design. That's what our study has shown, such as, for example, things that our municipal MPTs have been exposed to. And we are also electing our municipal MPTs to look at some of these when they make decisions that we constantly look for these um, decisions or these um, 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 challenges that create or reinforce the spatial structure that we are trying to undo and um, where you put um, high income areas on the one side and use major infrastructure development to as buffers to buffer people who are poor from people who are rich in areas. Um, the program itself helps us to look at standardized mechanisms to assess progress in spatial transformation. And it allows us to collect data um, on real time that enables us to assess and analyze changes in space as a result of interventions by programs that are implemented by our municipalities. And it is a vehicle as well for facilitating strategic intergovernmental engagement. And it also provides us with evidence-based solutions to um, dealing with those challenges and enabling peer-to-peer -peer learning, as well as sharing of um, tools and um, strategies to achieve spatial transformation. It is informed by um, 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 this idea that our municipal planning um, um, needs to be intelligence and data-based so that we have research-based solutions or solutions that are dependent on um, scientific research in defining the problem and choosing a set of solutions um, through the programs that we implement in our integrated development plans, in our spatial development frameworks, at municipal level, at regional level, and coordinated at national level. Um, the barometer is a research and data program, and it uses these sources. We use a set of sources that already exist in our national and research services and, and data development programs of government. And we also update that information continuously through the information that we extract from municipal plans as we improve the plans and we engage with municipalities and we observe. We have also started now to introduce um, reliance on technological tools such as flying of drones to confirm certain areas on hotspots and changes in land development in certain areas that are risk areas that needs to be monitored on constant basis and to inform municipal reactions um, in dealing with those. And that is what is part of the information that has been advised to us through the research that we undertook in 2022-2023 um, in 20 municipalities. And I'm going to share with the committee um, a set of key top 10 findings that emerge from that research. Um, we did that research looking at um, zooming in detail to a set of municipalities that were chosen um, very carefully to provide us with different typologies from the three categories of municipalities, A, B, C, to geographic typologies in terms of urbanized municipalities and rural municipalities, municipalities in different provinces that have um, a set of different characteristics from environmental sensitivity to areas where there is difficulties as a result of the history of an area, for example, former um, TBVC areas. And the list is, um, 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 as you can see, is distributed across the country um, choosing those typologies of municipalities. So the barometer uses a set of clustered indicators that look at governance and collaboration, how the arrangement of intergovernmental relations and um, facilitate cooperation in land development matters from regulation to implementation of um, plans to facilitating development and to cooperating on enforcement and compliance. 
um, planning, budgeting, and um, delivery implementation, and looking at the plans of municipalities, what they provide, what they don't provide, and what are the gaps. Spatial reconstruction, looking at um, intentionality of our plans and um, by assessing the objectives that municipalities include in their integrated development plans um, to be able to achieve intentional spatial transformation that enables us to ensure that our spaces are inclusive, the opportunity in our development is spread across all class, social, as well as economic um, 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 <clears throat> parameters. Um, quality of life, looking at a set of indicators, um, analyzing stats relating to demographics in the area and inputs that have been made by municipalities to improve those. The economy, um, issues of um, local economic development, performance and um, investments in municipalities, facilitation of those investments through partnerships between municipalities and role players in the local economic development in those areas, as well as intentional monitoring and guiding of that development to support the intentions of the municipality to transform and achieve the imperatives of social transformation and integration through space, as well as enabling um, integration through um, a planned public spaces that enable um, 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 people to start sharing their cities and towns in a manner that achieves their own individual objectives of um, participation in the economy. Um, in areas where there are considerations that needs to be taken into account, environmental sensitivity that is varied and um, depending on the geography of the municipality, as well as the roles and responsibilities in terms of the functions assigned to that municipality and for um, environment and addressing the challenges that are coming up with the changes in environment, including the climate change and participation of our municipalities in programs that seek to help the country to implement SDGs. And access, looking at the statistical information and assessing how far we are doing um, um, as municipalities in relation to a set of objectives on improving the lives of people and the quantums of changes as a result of the investments that we make by putting together a pipe, accessing um, and ensuring that a number of people increase that have access to clean water, that have access to a house, a clinic, a better road, and mobility, um, facilitating through partnerships, the spread of broadband network, and also integration of supporting urban systems, including transport, um, to the plans that municipalities adopt in their integrated human settlements, as well as in their spatial development frameworks that enable better mobility that helps municipalities to reduce the punishment that is unfair to poor people as a result of being placed far from opportunities, from places of opportunity and through the programs that we've implemented before. So there are 10 sets of key indicators Jefferson, that are summarized in slide 17 of the <clears throat> presentation, which deals with um, these key issues. Perhaps I will sit on this slide, Chairperson, just to emphasize a set of things. Um, what we found out in the engagement um, and through our research is that there is a problem of hunger for land that is continuing to disrupt intentional plans to transform space, including implementation of SPRUM, in which increasingly, but unintentionally, the activity of unlawful land occupation and unlawful entry into premises, as well as unlawful occupation of property has been one of the mechanisms that are becoming a dominant feature of providing access and forcing access by poor to strategic parcels of land. And the problem with it is that it is 
a process that's laced with criminality and it also disrupt intentional spatial transformation. So that's one of the things that um, 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 the research has, 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 has shown us. And the second one is around, um, and, and, and Jefferson, um, the slides below, um, I will, I'll, I'll keep mentioning the slide numbers. If we go to slide 18, it will indicate to you the examples, for example, in the province of Limpompo, where the lack of adoption of wall-to-wall -wall land use systems as required by Section 24 of SPLUMA has created difficulties and opportunity lost for many municipalities where people who have means to support the state through taxes or levies in the form of rates at municipal level simply walk out of the spaces that are currently defined and targeted for rate payment and build um, um, expenses and properties, but run away from um, contributions to state. And we are working with um, these stakeholders and particularly this, this, this phenomenon, it is increasingly um, 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 growing, particularly in the spaces that are former TPVC areas that are also underpinned by large tracts of land that are communally owned or that are shared between a municipality and the different roles of the, uh, of the um, 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 houses of traditional institution. And we think that the cooperation agreement as well as the framework will help us as well to make sure that we are able to ensure that we integrate these areas and then we are able to be able to make sure that we integrate as well this development to support the growth in municipalities from an economic point of view, as well as to enable the ability of the state to then mobilize resources that it plants back in supporting these areas by putting infrastructure that support the services for the people to live in these areas, such as roads. You can see, for example, the slide below, the roads are graveled, they are untarred, but um, 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 these are the things that we look at and um, we have started to see positive um, will for cooperation on, and, uh, on, on ensuring that we are able to follow these um, um, with support and to be able to engage um, um, stakeholders to also participate in contributing to the municipalities and um, revenue base, including the municipalities rates base and the municipalities to be able to extend services in those areas and support those areas with proper services. The second one is um, a discovery that um, there is persistent colonial and apartheid settlement patterns. And um, this finding, Chairperson, is informed by a number of things. It is informed by how we approve development plans. And it is also informed by our ability and capacity of the municipalities or the state at local government level to combine and enable the capacity to enforce compliance with approved development regulations, including the land use schemes, as well as ensure that we are able to guide development um, away from speculative development that um, would be driven by private developers if they are not guided. Um, we also believe that we can do a lot, Chairperson, as we are constantly engaging with the Department of Human Settlements as municipalities, um, if the implementation of large scale programs such as human settlements could also be infused with um, cooperation around ensuring these principles where we do not put people that are poor in spaces that are far from opportunity. And meaning at the end of a town, instead of utilizing the opportunities of the land parcels that remain vacant closer to um, places of opportunity for developing um, quality integrated 
um, makes use um, property development. Um, there is a number of municipalities um, that are suffering this challenge um, across, if you look at your slides, um, 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 from slide. Okay. Um, Chaperson, I think that's the, the first one. If we if we look at the third one, um, the third finding is that there's limited improvement in the quality of township and informal settlement, despite the investment that we've been trying to put in putting up programs of support, um, extending um, scale of service delivery, in particularly the areas that are defined as townships in South Africa, which are former areas that were areas of segregation, special segregation. Um, one, the feedback that we get is that um, the quality of, the compared quality of life experience between citizens in the country living in these types of spaces compared to citizens living in the type of spaces that we call suburban um, areas is different. And I think it is an area that um, 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 needs to be reinforced um, through structured spatial transformation interventions within the adopted integrated development plans and spatial development frameworks. Um, there's limited positive economic transition and change in townships um, compared to um, 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 other areas. Um, the difficulties in this chairperson are as a result of um, limited scope of opportunity, lesser investments, and investments are geographically concentrated outside of these areas. That is the feeling of the people out there. And I think that when we receive applications for development of opportunities such as approval of a land development um, application in relation to creating a space for commercial activity or industrial activity. These are some of the things that intentionally we need to ensure that those decisions are approved in spaces that also improve a fair distribution of that opportunity across a city, a town, or a municipal area. Um, the high levels of vulnerability to crime, environment, and um, um, economic shocks, because um, the infrastructure that exists in these municipal areas, particularly category B3 and B4 municipalities, is often old and aging infrastructure. And even in category A municipalities, recently we have in the areas of Etequini, um, in the south coast of KZN, northeastern parts of Eastern Cape, we have established that the plans that were approved for the towns that exist today were designed with infrastructure that is not sufficient to deal with the volumes of demand from the number of population that has grown in those areas to the number of activities that are concentrated in the economic activities that are concentrated in those areas. The roads don't support the volume of traffic, motor, motorized traffic that moves on those roads. The water pipes don't support the demand of the amount of water that is required to support an informal settlement or a town that has expanded as a result of the improvements that have not taken into account improving the on-site development at the same time that we improve the capacity of the bulk infrastructure that supports that development. So the applications in the office of the planning administration in a municipality needs to take these things into account when we approve um, um, development. And these are the things that our MPTs have been 
um, exposed to, and we are working tools together with them to help them in supporting to help them in supporting the ability to pick these issues as they decide on those applications. Um, infrastructure proofing that needs to be part of the requirements in approving large scale and um, developments in sensitive environmental areas. Persisting challenges with access and mobility, particularly in the areas that were segregated areas. Um, this is often caused by the example I showed earlier, Chairperson, where we have used in the design of settlement areas or townships, buffers through large infrastructure that separates people, or distance or failed to manage speculative development in the manner in which we enforce regulatory compliance by developers, where when they are given an opportunity to contribute, they would develop areas and when they develop property and, um, and, and, and sell this property, including property that is assisted by state intervention, they then create areas that continue to segregate and uses nimbyism, not in my backyard excuses such as a low value property cannot sit next to a high value property because it will not sell. We have had those kind of excuses. Um, there are areas where um, um, they don't make sense, Chairperson, and we have um, worked with municipalities to um, 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 start um, designing interventions to curtail um, um, those destructive and disruptive um, 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 developments. Inadequate focus on spatial transformation as a priority in a municipality. Spatial transformation that we have observed through our research, it is indicating Chaperson that it has been to a large degree not intentional. In other words, it lacks a champion inside the government institution municipality to drive it intentionally with a plan that is closely monitored. And as a result, um, it is ad hoc. Lack of common understanding of what the construct of spatial transformation means for a particular area and how it must be achieved, partly related to number seven. So we've been working at creating a standardized set of indicators so that we can be able to have a language that enables conversation around how space must be transformed what do we want to see when the space is transformed? And what do we want to then include in our budgets and in our plans to ensure that we achieve the objective of spatial transformation? What must be in our land use schemes that we must insist on to ensure that we are able to intentionally change the space, ensure there's better integration in our areas, there is better share of opportunity, development opportunity, and there's better cooperation in achieving that. So the, 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 the research is indicating to us that um, there is still um, a lack in that. And we agree with, um, and the research also agrees with the point that was made by my colleague in the previous presentation on the shortage of, um, on lack of capacity, particularly in relation to shortage of skill to undertake certain activities that are related to the function of municipal planning. Um, to this effect, Chairperson, there's a number of things that um, um, are raised, um, for example, around the capacity to operate geographic information systems and um, the capacity to ensure that plans in municipalities are informed by use of technology um, to indicate changes or to monitor changes in space as a result of the projects and the programs that are implemented and reports that are enabling decision makers with data that is real time based to make decisions that requ are required to intervene. 
And there's a number of things that um, 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 have been done in relation to this, which I will touch on in the concluding slides. Um, there's also the issue, Chairperson, that um, the, the, the research has um, 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 lifted up, which is an affirmation of um, anecdotal data that we have held before, that there is insufficient funding to achieve objectives of special transformation, particularly in struggling municipalities with low revenue base. With good intentions sometimes, the combination and the mobilization of resources from partnerships within government and outside of government is below the demand. And municipalities as a result of that battle with addressing backlogs in development, backlogs in various aspects of service delivery, and these add up to reinforce the colonial, spatial, and apartheid spatial form that we inherited when we started the democratic dispensation. Chair, um, I've used um, um, and that slide to go through a number of, um, 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 a list of slides um, um, that are following. Um, we've shared the presentation with the a committee um, which has more detail on each of those findings and examples from various municipalities um, that we have used in our research to address, which we, um, to, to also um, um, receive information and gather information on those key issues. And I will not um, be reading word for word on the detailed slides, Chairperson, um, that we have um, indicated, except to quickly summarize or allow Chairperson to give us maybe the concluding um, 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 remarks um, in relation to what we are doing as SALGA um, from the research. The research has indicated that we need to address the issue of land hunger. And the issue of land hunger um, is an issue that if it is not addressed, we are not going to be able to deal with the disruptive interruptions such as unlawful land occupation, unlawful occupation of property, unlawful entry into premises. Um, we have identified a number of opportunities to the programs that already exist in government and the intergovernmental relations platform that exists in government to address this issue within the broader program of the country on land reform. Um, the promotion of and support of development of capacity in municipalities. We've identified a set of municipalities working closely with Dalrat and, um, and Cocta who need capacity building and in various areas. And um, we are continuing with that work um, um, through this partnership. And we also utilize the platforms that have been raised earlier technically to monitor um, the constant development of this capacity. And we are happy to present to confirm as well that um, while we had teething problems at the beginning of the operations of Spluma in 2015, especially in the first two years, there has been a heightened improvement um, after the period 2022 onward. Um, and as a result, it is work that we'll continue to do so that we are able to ensure that um, Spluma is implemented. And we are happy as well to indicate that that were raised initially around the lack of scope for participation that was lacking as a result of some of the clauses that we have put in the regulations of Spluma. And we have tested certain um, 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 opportunities that we want to see in the amendment of Spluma, where, for example, in the municipal planning tribunals, there is space deliberately created for the involvement of um, 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 representatives of um, traditional authorities in a local area so that decision-making is done around a single table on a land development matter, wall-to-wall -wall in a municipality. Development tools 
Um, we've developed a set of development tools along with um, um, rural development and others directly with SALGA to support municipalities. And we've placed these at the hands of a municipal council to guide municipal council in developing own bylaws and policies to address the scourge of land hunger through a land assembly and land disposal policy, um, disruptions from unlawful land occupation and unlawful occupation of property, as well as unlawful entry into properties, and tools that relate to supporting municipalities to manage those incidences and what to do pre in order to prevent it during as well as after it has happened. And we have taken and continuing to do so municipalities through the content of these um, 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 tools so that they can be able to customize them and um, where municipalities lack capacity on their own to develop them. And um, we've established a set of cooperation um, um, with various stakeholders that are critical in ensuring that we are able to achieve special transformation using the tools such as Pluma and others, including um, integrated human settlements programs. Um, we've got cooperation that um, was mentioned earlier with the department as well as DCOC. We have a formal framework that we have adopted in September 2023 with the National House um, 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 as well as um, Department of Traditional Affairs that will guide decision making in conflict resolution in, in con conflict resolving that impacts on concerns and challenges on land development matters at a municipal level and we hope that some of these things will also guide the areas that we identify for improvement during the period of the amendment of spluma and its supporting regulations Chairperson, I can probably um, um, hand over to my chairperson to just uh, make these concluding remarks. And this is where I would end the presentation, the detailed presentation. We've shared the presentation, it's got 63 slides, but I think um, 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 instead of reading word for word, we have um, captured the 10 key findings of the research we have undertaken. Over to you, my chairperson, um, Councillor Mashikala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zano. Um, Chair, we have put a very detailed uh, report presentation to you. And let me quickly deal with uh, what uh, Zano is asking me to do. Uh, Zano, is it uh, what we have put on the screen now? Yes, Chair, the last two, um, um, you, it's the yeah. last two slides, yes. The last two slides, yeah, like we, yes. yes. Now, what we are saying to the committee and the minister and the team uh, that, uh, let us define, Zano, you, you, are, you are, are you fine now? Yes, yes, Chair. Because I wanted to start with that one, but let me deal with this one. Um, yeah, on the one to say, look, it's important for us to define progress, measure and assess the impact from the perspective of Salga. Three, to hold government institution and their partners on their toes and accountable as such. There's a need and that we want to put on record before the committee agree on indicators to be used to benchmark and monitor spatial transformation in all the geographic areas. Continuously evaluate and monitor the impact of spatial intervention geared towards spatial transformation and understand and unpack the current status quo, both in terms of constraints and opportunities, and explore sought after special outcomes guided and informed by Spluma. The last slide. Mobilize resources and partnership for in innovation and technology support for municipal planning programs. Example, acquiring critical capacity in service, 
uh, like the GIS and flying on drones to update spatial and project monitoring cap capabilities on us. Professionalization in the context of SPLU municipal planning. Salga has an MOU with the planning profession, firstly to persuade municipalities to recruit registered planners to sign off on planning work and providing continuous professional development support to planners and work with all four municipalities. On the lack of funds, there is an advanced progress pro process of lobbying for the review of the LG funding framework and Salga has concluded its study to inform its positions in the IGR process. Uh, so, Chair, I think these are the concluding remarks you want to make and also hand to you and uh, appreciate the moment that you have given to Salva. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, honorable members. That is uh, the presentations on Spluma from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, as well as SALCA. Before we get underway with uh, the questions of clarity or comments, allow me to excuse uh, the minister as she is uh, going to attend a cabinet committee meeting now at 11. Honorable members, uh, we'll then open the session for questions of clarity and comments on both presentations. And please do identify the uh, questions is there for the Department of Osalta. Honorable Klappe. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> And uh, greetings to my colleagues on the platform, the department and representatives of Salada. Yeah, Chair, let me welcome the presentation both by the department and uh, by Salga. Let me start probably with the department. Having listened to the department, I would want to just talk to the issues on chapter three, where the department, where this uh, act as Pluma plays the department in a very tight situation of providing support to both uh, provinces and local government in terms of implementing Pluma. The department chair has indicated that uh, they have supported through some way paying for gazettes and the challenges ranges from those including disruptions as and when or during instances where municipalities are placed under administration. I just want to understand from the department's point of view do you think you are winning in terms of uh, your role in implementing SPLUMA? And I, I say this because according to what you presented, intergovernmental relations becomes the backbone of implementation of this SPLUMA. So for lack of better word, you play a role of big brother kind of where you come in with funding and whereas the situation on the ground won't change. 45 municipalities supported, 36, there's still going ongoing challenges. Are you winning? What has Honorable Tape, are you with us? Yes, 
Oh, you are frozen. Oh, let me switch off the video. Can you now hear me? Yes, please continue. Okay. The other question would be, what are the real concerns of the traditional and Khoisan leaders in land use management? Do you plan their involvement or what will be their role in this whole thing? Can you estimate to us how much have you spent in one or two terms in the support of SPUMA so that we are able to know to what extent is the problem of funds in local government's implementation of SPUMA? Coming to Salga Chair, um, I like what you indicated because uh, was, I wanted to find out the role of Salga in the whole thing, but uh, your first or second slides indicated that you presenting the, your perspective, that is the outlook. Now, I want to understand from your perspective, have the objectives of Pluma been achieved in local municipalities? And uh, just explain a bit what you will your answer be, whether if it's not, what are the challenges still and how you're dealing with? You have talked to those I saw that on the on the last slides, and these are the questions that I was noting as and when you were presenting. Now, also, as Salga, <clears throat> talking to the question that I asked the Department of Intergovernmental Relations, the success of intergovernmental relations. Do you think with the challenges that we have outlined for a local government is best placed as the implementer of SPLUMA as a SALGA? Now, I would also want to find out from your good self or if given a chance, what will be the key issues you would want to review in uh, a SPLUMA as local government? I understood that municipalities are reviewing that every five months, but every five years. But if you were given a chance, what will be key issues that we want to review? No, Spluma. There's an interesting slide, Chair, yeah, the key indications in monitoring spatial uh, transformation. Have the organization set out targets? for municipalities in, uh, in improving these uh, indicators, or do you have outcomes in mind or somewhere that you could cascade down to municipalities to say, based on these indicators that we have identified through this report that we have, this could be the outcomes. Now, there's also a, an indication, Chair, Salga interventions. The last two slides is speaking to that. And I would want to know, besides uh, the funding and uh, the, the thing, the professionalization, the professional shortage in terms of local government, what is it really that needs to be done to make sure that municipalities implement a spluma to the best of the expectation chair? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Tape. The Honorable Ntate Masipa. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. And um, I just want to also thank the presenters for the good presentation. Chair, I think the um, the starting point for me is basically where Metape left with regards to the funds that have been allocated, uh, questioning the funds that have been allocated. I think I will just want to follow up on that particular question to say how much um, has been funds allocated to actually look at the rural villages. And I'm talking now the former homelands because Lots of things are happening in these rural villages, like malls are being built in the flood line and all those kind of stuff. What is their level of participation in ensuring that the planning there 
is executed really in the uh, proper way in terms of the special planning. And I think uh, follow, uh, following on that is um, uh, the, the engagements between the Spluma uh, or Salga and the, um, I mean, the executors of the special planning and, 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 and the traditional leaders seems to have taken place. But despite all these engagements of traditional leaders, it is reported that there's still resistance by traditional uh, institution to implement Spluma. What uh, what are the bottlenecks there? What are causing these things? Why are there still these bottlenecks that uh, the, the traditional leaders are are not really accepting the spluma, you know, in in their traditional areas? Also, um, on Salga, you know, can you indicate which um, municipalities have signed service level agreements with the traditional uh, authorities? and whether this has uh, helped to ease the tension or improve collaboration between municipalities and traditional uh, authorities in rural areas in implementing this, pl this pluma. Um, also to Salka once again, um, can you indicate whether customary system of land allocation applicable in traditional communities are taken into consideration in decision-making regarding land use scheme? Uh, the final one, uh, not, not the final one, one of the key challenges indicated by the department is that there is a shortage of financial and human resources across fears of government to implement um, the SPLOMA effectively. So the question for me really is um, what has been really done to ensure that this is being addressed? There is obviously... Um, an issue of uh, non-compliance. Um, can you really just uh, maybe just um, uh, talk to us in terms of land use scheme non-compliance that um, uh, it's been um, uh, indicated during the presentation? What support uh, was provided to ensure that there is a, a, a compliance? Uh, to the department, isn't it perhaps necessary to bring on the uh, systematic evaluation by the T DPME to look into whether the act is really achieving its objective prior to tabling an amendment. I think we definitely uh, chair, need a um, comprehensive review. It is nine years into implementation of the act and we still decry you know, lack of skills and uh, what has the department really done to support these munic municipalities to ensure that you know they're able to execute their tasks. Chair, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ntatema Sipa, the Honorable Ntatema uh, Tiasa. The Honorable Kappa, Bao Kappa. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, let me thank both presentations and appreciate the information that has been printed, presented to us. I'll have a few questions here, clarity of clarity here, and also comments. First of all, I would like some further clarity on the role of the provincial government or the province or any department that is relevant to this uh, act, so that their role is uh, clarified, including the modus operandi of this legislation or linkage between the provincial, national, and local government on this part. And uh, also clarifying local, I mean the local government, whether it's district or local, and for that, and maybe clarify also. There was an area where it was said it, it is the only the Western Cape which has uh, achieved an, an issue there. But I would like some clarity on those. But why the Eastern? It is the only. It is only the Western Cape. Is there anything that they have, or anything that uh, prevents other provinces, or something that they do? What makes it 
them to be able to implement that. Uh, and that and there's that thing now of the oh I also like to get the trend of this non-compliance so that maybe these things or causes of that can, can be corrected. It will assist if that be the case. Now, my also very serious concern is that the this legislation, I'm afraid we can spend 20, 30 years working on the legislation, the act. And yet the department here is having areas of uh, land administration. And I'm also worried that this land administration in the department is somehow detached or delinked from uh, land, land reform. I would like to see if there is anything that can link this land reform in the department with land administration. But my main concern here is that here we are talking about the act, we're talking about the legislation mainly, and we can amend and start the legislation for many, many years. But the implementation here, the department, how do they get out of this uh, area specific of emphasis on, on the act and go to their program on land use management? Not necessarily the act, but the management itself, because it's something that can be done based on the act more than prefer, I mean, uh, emphasizing on the act, because the act can be done. And some people are very happy if we keep on talking about legislation, changing shapes and changing colors, not implementing exactly what the act is, de is designed for. Because there is this serious situation, which is uh, reflected by, the, by, by Salga there. Before, before then I go to Salga. Because on Salga there, on slide 17, they indicated a lot of issues, I think about eight or nine of them. But I would have also liked to see proposed solutions because those are the real things that are affecting our society. Is there any possibility that this uh, issue can be resolved? Because here there are two South Africans here. There is the rich one, there is a poor one. And it seems others don't want others next to them. And at the same time, there's a reality that there are these crime areas in, in these special areas. You got different life in, in Soweto and a different life in another part of, of Johannesburg or County. So these things are interesting. And these are things which should be changed. These are things which talk about this transformation, of which I'm worried if transformation, there is a slow implement of this transformation because it is the very, very thing that we're talking about. If this transformation, we talk about, about it more than seeing it implemented and see the shortcomings. That's what those are the things I would like to, to be highlighted here, Chair, so that we see things that should be done or things that should be proposed for, to, for solutions that exist. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kappa. Uh, the Honorable uh, Le Kappa. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, greetings to the department, to Salga, and to Honorable Members. I think, Chair, I'm, I'm partly covered in most of the issues. Um, I think with the department, uh, Honorable Kappa, if I'm not mistaken, highlighted to say he wants to know what is the role of provincial government and maybe to a certain extent the role of the department um, in terms of monitoring the implementation. Um, what is our monitoring plan? How do we monitor municipalities to see if this um, Spluma is being implemented at a municipal level. We know in some municipalities 
they are being implemented. But in other municipalities, there are certain aspects that are not considered. And if they are not, then it becomes very difficult for the municipality to to implement. And to what extent does the department include traditional leaders? Because whether we like it or not, we cannot speak of land without including traditional leaders. Because most of the land or some of the land that we need to use for residential or for any other purpose belongs to the traditional leaders. It's a tribal land and it has its own ways and processes um, before we can use it. And there is this thing, Chairperson, of municipalities wanting or not wanting to use tribal land or when tribal land is being used for residential purposes, then there's an issue of not of services not being um, accessible in that particular land. So there would always be an excuse of saying we can't put water, electricity, sewage or whatever because it's a tribal land. And that is mostly out of the fact that these stakeholder engagements, they don't get to a point where everyone needs to know their role. So even traditional leaders themselves, it does not end at just exposing the land to say, here's the land, our people can live here. But they, they need, there has to be an understanding of the interdependency of the different stakeholders uh, in order for our people to get land, but not just land, to get what comes with land, the services, there's housing and there's all of these things. So the special transformation plan should come with that, but the department should also have a way of monitoring municipalities, not only after five years, there has to be a way of keeping track to see if a municipality is making improvements or not. And if they are not, there has to be immediate interventions that are done on the spot to find a way and intervene in municipalities implementing um, Spluma. But with Salga as well, um, these indicators that they use to measure uh, special transformation if you look at them, they're also interdependent, um, right? You can't speak of governance and collaboration without ensuring that there is quality of life, without ensuring that our people are part of the economy. And the reasons why you find so many informal settlements now moving towards town, moving towards where the economy is, is because we are not able to take transformation to back where they stay. In as much as they work in the town or in the economic hub, they still need to go back home. But the reason why they move away from home is because we speak of land, but we don't speak of basic services being taken to them. Uh, the municipalities are not giving services to our people, and the department is not able to come and intervene. If they have, it's very few municipalities that they do that. Otherwise, we would not find ourselves with so much influx of people moving away from rural areas, from townships to town and creating informal settlements near towns, near railway lines, and all of that. That is because they are moving away from where there are no services to where there are services, but also to where the economy is. Uh, so the department together with Salga, I, I, I agree with, with this presentation of Salga. Um, in many times, Salga comes out to be as truthful as possible. And if to a certain extent we can take Salga's presentations, not just on land, but on any other aspect and find a way of the department considering and prioritizing it would solve a lot of our problems. Uh, the presentation shows that there has been work being done on the ground, but we seem to be very far from the ground. Um, Dr. Trape mentioned that you can speak about these things, but the immediate things that are needed on the ground need to be addressed. And you can't do it if we come, the department says, oh, there's no funding, and then it ends there. We need reasons why these municipalities are not supported. If it's not funding, what else is there? Because you can't just say it's funding and then it ends there. Uh, every time there's money being rotated around, uh, but critical issues like this one, ensuring that municipalities are stable and municipalities are assisted in terms of giving our people land, um, you know, planning properly, 
the municipalities should be able to predict, Chairperson, to say in the next five years or in the next 10 years, looking at the economy, looking at what the municipality has to offer in the economic uh, uh, circle, this is what we expect. It's not a, it's not something that happens overnight that you wake up in the morning and you find 50,000 50, people moving into a town. It's because there has been a trend. It shows that there's going to be an economic hub here. There's going to be an economic system here that, that rotates. We expect population to grow in the next how many years. And these are some of the things that the department should also be able to pick up as they do their monitoring, uh, as they look at their monitoring plan in, in municipalities so that they check those things and they also assist municipalities in planning for that so that we don't find ourselves with a municipality saying, no, no, we've got now a population is growing and we don't know what to do. We are not able to provide infrastructure is not enough. This is not enough. The capacity of the municipality is not enough. When we could have picked it up years before as we do our planning, because spatial is part of that. You need to plan ahead. And that is what we are doing. If What we are doing now here, if it has to be implemented, is going to be implemented and benefit, and, and benefit people in the next three to five years. So there has to be plans for that, but also there has to be immediate interventions that are done, considering the fact that our economy is growing and as it grows, it means there's going to be more needs, more basic needs. There's going to be more ne uh, need of land. And we are still at a at a at a point where we must discuss which land must we get give to our people, which land must we use for residential, which should have been done a long time ago. Land audit should have told us, should have given us a clear understanding to say this is the land that we can use for agriculture, this land we can use for residential, and therefore it means this land, if we were to use it for this coming years, this is what we would need. But the reality is that the department needs to give us a clear plan of how are they monitoring this implementation from municipalities and where municipalities are failing, what are the immediate interventions that they come up with in ensuring that um, the act itself is implemented. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Letlape. The Honorable uh, Chaita. The Honorable Mamu Trader. The visit in Kosenkul, the Honorable Tabekulu. Thank you, Chairperson. Greetings to you, Chairperson, and all members of the committee, the support team, department, and Salga. Chairperson, from what I've just been hearing, it seems to me these two uh, uh, presentations are complementing each other when it comes to land management. So it, it then it makes me have no question and no uh, comment, Chairperson, except that I have absorbed, absorbed a lot from, from both uh, 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 presentations and the it, it then showed that uh, there are some difficulties in dealing with the, uh, the land issue when we have to as well look at uh, uh, the position the department has just placed as well as the uh, uh, SALCA that uh, there, there is still uh, an outstanding uh, uh, issue of, of the land matter between uh, traditional leadership and, 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 and uh, our, our, our government. So really, I, I, I wouldn't have any question or comment yet. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Uh, are there any other honorable members on the platform I've not recognized who may wish to pose a question? Uh, 
If not, uh, thank you, honorable members. Allow me to also uh, welcome the presentations uh, put uh, to the portfolio committee by the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development. And also appreciate uh, the presentation uh, from uh, Salga on Spluma. Honorable members, I have a few questions also to sponsor to both presentations. The first would be uh, <clears throat> Spluma, honorable members, is intended to ensure efficient use of resources, facilitating development, prioritizing areas that were previously excluded, and to ensure improved intergovernmental relations. The report that we have received from Salga's barometer suggests in slide 17 that there is persistence of apartheid settlement patterns in spite of spluma. And there is also an adequate focus on spatial transformation as a priority. I ask both Salga and the department to reflect a bit on this challenge because it may suggest that our success story with regard to compliance to legislation may not be yielding the result we anticipated. Secondly, honorable members, in provision of uh, support and monitoring performance of municipalities, SPLUMA allows for differentiation of municipalities under section 11. Has there been any categorization or differentiation of the 257 metro district and local municipalities in South Africa? What was, the, what was the criteria used and how, was that, how has that helped in achieving the outcomes that the department has presented in terms of compliance with the legislation? Thirdly, in terms of Section 36 of SPLUMA, municipal councillors are not allowed to be part of municipal planning tribunals. Planning literally shows that the decision-making processes regarding planning matters, politicians and planners, and the influence of politicians has increased over the last decade or so. In some jurisdictions, plans that are not accepted by politicians more than often produce no result. How has the municipal planning tribunals operated in South Africa? What has been your experience with regard to an interface of politicians and planners at local level? Fourthly, honorable members, I would also like to uh, like to understand and get a, a, to deal with the question of informality especially when it comes to an inclusion of rural areas in land use management process. We know of long-standing challenge with institution of traditional leadership with a perception that Spluma is taking over their responsibility, it, responsibilities. How have both the department and Salka intervened to address this matter of and concern of traditional leaders? Spluma uh, provides for land use scheme to develop, to manage land development across all areas in municipalities. Rural areas are part of the continuum of land use planning and management as they have unique conditions and social cultural dimensions. Between 2015 and 2023, honorable members, I'd like to know what changes is the department or Salga seeing in terms of spatial planning and land use in rural areas under traditional leaders. Sixth, the norms and standards signed by the minister provides for service level agreements between municipalities and traditional authorities to facilitate partnerships. Whilst this is welcomed, my question is whether traditional councils can legally be granted 
land planning and land use powers in terms of service level agreements with municipalities contrary to the provisions of the Act and the Constitution. This view arises because Pluma's Regulation 19 specifically states that traditional councils will not have decision-making powers in relation to land planning and land use. However, it also creates space for traditional councils to be given some powers and functions under the terms of a service level agreement. Lastly, honorable members, uh, my question is to the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and R Rural Development. You will know that this uh, National Assembly has passed the Preservation and Development of Agricultural Land Bill known as PEDAL. During the discussion on the bill, it was very clear that PEDAL dealing with the provincial agricultural sector plans must take into consideration Spluma. Have you had any engagement with the branch dealing with PIDAL? And what are the implications of that bill for Spluma and the work that you do as a department? That would be all on my side, honorable members. We will now hand over to the department to respond to the questions and comments of honorable members. You have 20 minutes as well as, uh, actually now we've got 30 minutes. Oh no, we still have quite a lot of time. So now you can continue uh, with responses and then we'll take responses from Salka. Over to the department, Kenton. Thank you, thank you, Chair and honorable members. And thank you for the insightful questions and we'll do our best to answer all of them um, between myself and Rajesh. So um, I think firstly, if we look at um, Honourable Klape's, um, um issues relating to the IGR in Chapter 3, um, we do provide um, support for her, and, and I think um, CD Rajesh has indicated that. We provide a national forum and we provide various uh, prov provincial fora for Spluma and the, the aim of these fora are really to bring out issues relating to all forms of, of, of um, planning within municipalities and help municipalities resolve the issues that, that are emanating from those fora. Um, the question was, is the department winning in the implementation of, of SPLUMA? I think to, an honest assessment would be that in 80% of municipalities, we are, or, or SPLUMA is being in, implemented to a, a, a acceptable degree. I think the, the key concept that we need to um, take forward is that the SDFs that are compulsory to be developed and the land use management schemes that are compulsory to be developed must always go back to the principles that are stipulated in the Act. and. I think the, the principles that we need to just maybe quickly just look at um, in terms of the Act is when we talk to the uh, in section, the objectives of the Act, and then you've got the, yeah, you know, and I have the principles here, but I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to go through. But I think if the principles that are in the Act are dealt with correctly at the SDF level, then the FDF, F, SDF that is approved by council should start taking into all these items around apologies, uh, um, all these um, should take into account all the activities that change the spatial transformative direction. And I think the one area that we, we really need to um, look at is the adopted SDFs that are adopted by councils um, prior to them being published must show how this transformation takes place. And remember the remembering that the municipal planning tribunals use those SDFs to then advise them on what the strategic direction of that municipality is. So I of the opinion, and Rajesh could maybe just add on that, is as we move forward. I think um, related to this chairperson is that and members 
is that we have supported the the municipalities and we've got the the numbers that were given also by Rajesh since the start over the last nine years. We've got the the 36 SDFs and the 45 land use management schemes. And I think the word a big brother approach um was used by the Honorable Atlape to say, look, are, are we in are we having a top-down approach? And I think the department has always taken a bottom-up approach in terms of Spluma. I think that's why the the DFA challenge said that um planning is at a local level. And so on every case, when we get through our national spatial planning fora and our um, provincial spatial planning fora, our provincial officers in the provinces, we've got one in every province, they would then attend and we would then get requests from those municipalities to support them financially with the SDFs. We um, obviously would be the ones that are funding, but we do not do the work on behalf of, so we appoint a consultant to work with the municipality and they then produce that SDF or the land use scheme at their, their pace within their um, area of jurisdiction. Um, I want to go on to our Honorable Mapisa. We what, what funding do we allocate? And I think the the allocation of funds and and it would be I, I think just dangerous to give a, a estimation of of what what the funds would be. And I think there was another question that also raised how much money are we spending? But an SDF and a land use scheme, we go out for open bids. They are are and you can see there's quite a few that have been done and. In, there was a, a point over the last nine years where you could be getting, and it depending on the size of the municipality, the complexity of the SDF, et cetera, et cetera, the price would vary. Of recent times, we have found that the there's a lot of competition within the market to do them, and the prices have been um, actually coming down for the development of SDFs and land use management schemes um, that we have um, published. But obviously, the information is available for 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 all the the work that has been done. Um, when we look at the 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 DPMV DPME review, honourable um, like and chairperson uh, Mapisa and chairperson, there there hasn't been a comprehensive review done by the DPME. I think one of the things that also has guided this how well spatial planning is working is that as we've developed the National Spatial Development Framework, a lot of intergovernmental work was done with DPME and all the sectors of government, including local municipalities, to come up with that plan for 2050. And as we look at the, the plan for 2050, we then start seeing how the population growth the economic projections, the climate change projections, the all those uh, the water scarcity projections, how they will affect the spatial layout in the country, and which areas we, or the country believes, and, and I think we have to say the country believes will be affected, and where future development will happen. The challenge now lies, and I think it was also said by the president when the NSDF was adopted, is that. We now have to, the challenge is eating this pudding because we have given the framework to the country. And now it's very important, um, emanating from the, the NDP, we've got the NSDF, and now all these other activities like the national infrastructure plans and the, the water and all the SDFs need to start talking to the realities that we believe we will have in 2050. So that, that is going to be a challenge. And, and on the review, the, the, the clear answer is, has the DPME done a review um, of the program? No. Salga's work, and, and we, we, we do commend them on, on the barometer that they've done and that we've also participated in, does start showing us that local level 
of information of how well Spluma has done over the last um, 10 years or so. Um, Honorable Kapa, thank you for your comments and Chairperson, and to you. I think uh, uh, Section 10 uh, also starts talking to the clarity on the roles of, of provincial government. Yes, the, the, the province may also, in terms of the Spluma, get involved in the um, matters that are concerning um, provincial interest. They look at any remedial measures um, due to the failure of a municipality to comply with obligations in terms of the Act. They also deal with various issues. They also can have a provincial special development framework. And the, the Premier, in subject to obviously to the Constitution, may assist the municipality in approving an adoption of its land use scheme. Um, it may facilitate and coordinate the land use management system of different municipalities or a system of a municipality with um, structure plans, development strategies, and programs of national and provincial organs of state. So the 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 part there is, is obviously in chapter three again in, in intergovernmental relations that we look at there. Um, then I just want to go to um, something that's close to my heart um, in terms of the the um, the planning for traditional leaders, Honorable Mandela, um, in terms of um, how how we plan to work with the traditional leaders in terms of, as we understand this, we have a special development framework for the total municipality, wall to wall. And within that, we have then the traditional areas. The, the traditional areas, um, the outer boundaries obviously sometimes are known and sometimes the outer boundaries are not known. So part of the work that we're doing under the holistic planning program um, with the National House of Traditional Leaders and uh, National House of Quetz and Traditional and Khoisan Leaders and in the various provincial houses is to work on coming up with a methodology that starts addressing the 887 traditional spaces in the land over, over, over the time period. Initially, we've done this as an in-house project using our um, land capabilities of the deeds office, the cadaster office, spatial planning and land use office. Um, and within that office, then we have also got GIS capabilities. We've got some uh, remote sensing capabilities and the idea is that that every of of the the areas identified um, and agreed upon, we are working with those traditional areas to come up with a methodology that looks holistically at land use planning and management in a traditional area to impart skills and also to look at the informal rights, to look at uh, climate-related issues at flooding areas, um, et cetera, and also at environmental areas. Now, the purpose of that land planning is to work, when we go into the area, we work with the local municipality and the chief and the, the traditional leadership. All the technical skills, we sit down around the table, and then we work and we explain how this area will slot in to the, the broader um, local spatial development framework. And part of this is the, the process is to ensure that as we look at the amendments to Spluma, that we look at how land that that is under the custodianship or the, under a, a traditional area will then be considered by a municipal planning tribunal where when we amend Spluma, we ha actually have the change, the, the amend the act to ensure that the traditional area is represented in that uh, municipal planning tribunal when decisions relate and affect the specific council um, that is being obviously um, dealt with under specific application. And that is to ensure that we don't have a situation where 
that we have uh, us and them at that um, SDF level, but that the plan then takes into account everybody. Also, when we look at the growth of the traditional areas, the setting out of stands, the planning, and, and the agricultural areas, that the municipality are also fully aware of this land plan that's being done in a very holistic way, and that they are then able to allocate the resources because in terms of the allocation of funds, the, 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 the funding has to be in your IDP and it has to align to the SDF um, at that local level. So those are a few of the, the points that I, I wanted to um, point out. Um, Rajesh, uh, would you maybe I'll I'll come up with a follow up, but for now, Rajesh, would you like to just come in on on some of the areas that you've identified, please? Yeah, thank you, DDG. Uh, thank you, honourable chair and members. Just to add uh, to what DDG Hyman has said, uh, maybe let me start with the issues raised by honourable uh, member Dr. Slape. I think just to add to what DDG has said, are we winning? I think yes, we are winning. Uh, it's a slow win, but I think we are winning. Uh, I, I think that uh, the intergovernmental relations that we have been, or the mechanisms that we have been working through uh, together with provinces and our colleagues here in Saga has really, and I think my colleague from Saga also mentioned, we were struggling probably in the first two, two, two and a half years, but I think the system is now starting to mature. Uh, and we are definitely uh, making more inroads. I think there's still a few challenges at municipal level, but uh, I think together with our colleagues in Salga, we are trying to take the message to municipalities about the importance of Spluma and the value that it brings. And I think it answers some of the uh, the, the other concerns raised by honorable members. I think we 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 trying to position Spluma in such a way that uh, municipalities understand the value that it brings to uh, the business of the municipality. So if you have a land use scheme, if you have a spatial development framework, if you have processes and systems uh, to uh, process your land development applications, you actually attract investment. Uh, and if you are able to deal with those land development uh, applications effectively, uh, then developers and the private sector want to invest in your municipality because they know there's certainty around that process. And I think that's the position that we now want to try and make municipalities un understand better. So it's not only about setting aside budgets for your, your spatial development framework, your land use scheme, and the planners that you need Let's initially invest in that. And I think eventually, once your systems and processes mature, you are able to attract investment. And linked to that is once you approve those land development applications, there are rates that you, especially from your more commercial type developments, uh, your higher end uh, residential, uh, and you then increase the revenue base of the municipality. And I think that's the message that we are trying to take through. Uh, and I think we worked closely with Selga also in terms of uh, when they did the training for the new councillors. So so those are the, the issues that we are continuing to work with them. Uh, uh, Honourable uh, Slab. I think the, the real concerns about traditional leaders and uh, without getting into too much detail, we are indeed uh, making inroads. I think uh, the challenge that traditional uh, leaders have is that they feel excluded from the spatial planning and land use management uh, processes of municipalities. The problem is not simple, it's complex. And I think Honorable Chair, you, you raised it. Uh, there's restrictions in terms of constitutional powers. There's restrictions in terms of other pieces of legislation and to use uh, the Municipal Structures Act as an example, Section 81 restricts uh, councillors from uh, participating in council and council meetings. So 
together, I think with Salga, we understand these complexities and we're trying to work around them. And I think my colleague from Salga touched on one of the solutions is to ensure that traditional leaders on the ground have an opportunity to input into decision-making by municipalities. And to answer the question raised by Honorable Chair, within the current constitutional framework and uh, the guidance that was provided by the Constitutional Court around the DFA matter and the restriction of powers of not only traditional leaders, but also of national government in terms of municipal planning is something that we are trying to navigate through. So, so I think uh, we, we have a few ideas. We've discussed it on the ground and there seems to be a little bit of uh, buy-in about ensuring that uh, traditional leaders on the ground are included in decision-making processes. And I think in practice, it it happens well in some parts of the country. Uh, in terms of the estimates and how much we have spent, I think over the 10 years, uh, without getting into the details of numbers, we can definitely make that available. But just to indicate uh, to Honorable uh, Dr. Slape is that we don't only support municipalities. There are even provinces where we have uh, assisted them to develop uh, draft provincial legislation uh, to review their spatial development frameworks. We're currently supporting uh, Free State. Uh, we've su also supporting Northern Cape. Uh, so it's not only about municipalities. I think the issue of capacity and funding cuts across uh, both uh, provinces and municipalities. So Section 9 and Chapter 3, as you have indicated, is important that... Uh, as a department responsible uh, for the implementation of SPLUMA, we are able, and Section 9 gives ministers the powers to support both provinces and municipalities. I think uh, just to also add to the question raised by Honorable Masipa, in terms of comprehensive reviews on implementation of SPLUMA, yes, we, we have done a five-year review. Uh, we have that report available if uh, the honourable members want to look at that, we can provide it. And we're also planning to do a very comprehensive 10-year review. So we are in the planning stages now, uh, and the actual comprehensive review is going to be undertaken uh, between uh, or in the new financial year. So that when we get to June 2025, honourable chair and honourable members, we have a real status on the ground, verified with portfolio of evidence around the implementation of Spluma. And I think that is a, this 10 year milestone is very important to us uh, to ensure that we are not only ticking the boxes, but we ensure, and I mentioned it when I was presenting that we're also looking at the quantitative aspects of it. Uh, so are your instruments promoting spatial transformation, for example, is your spatial development framework transformative in its nature to address your spatial ch challenges as a municipality. And then I think that's work that we want to do going forward. I think in terms of uh, Honorable Kappa and your questions, uh, G. G. Hyman has touched on it. Uh, and just to reconfirm that provincial government, yes, they have a role. Uh, provincial legislation and developing provincial legislation is uh, one of their responsibilities. Uh, they have to develop a provincial spatial development framework and monitoring and support. And I think those three areas are the key areas that provinces or the powers that provinces have in terms of Spluma. And that's why, on Honorable Kappa, many provinces are neither here nor there whether they want provincial legislation. I must also indicate to you and give you the reassurance that uh, I think Northern Cape has a bill, Lampopo has a bill, Free State has a bill. Uh, KZN, they had a Planning and Development Act, Free Spluma. Uh, a number of this, the uh, sections in that act were found to be unconstitutional, but I know that they are in the current year uh, starting a process to develop a bill. Uh, Northwest has a bill, Pumalanga has a bill. Eastern Cape is just starting on their process. But what they've done in Eastern Cape, uh, importantly, is even though they haven't got provincial legislation, uh, 
uh, Honorable Kaba, they have uh, passed a uh, a bill that repeals all the old order legislation. So that's a positive step that they are taking forward. So now you don't have the multiple pieces of legislation that used to govern this particular space in the Eastern Cape. Uh, Sao Teng, I must be honest, uh, in our engagements with uh, the colleagues in province, it, they feel that they don't really need a provincial legislation because they have three big metropolitan spaces, uh, the city of Johannesburg, the Swane, and the Kuruleni, who have very comprehensive bylaws. Uh, so together with the Spluma and those bylaws, uh, the system seems to be working in Gauteng, but that's a decision that the province needs to take. Uh, the Act does give them, the Spluma does give them the power to develop their own uh, legislation. I think uh, DDG Hyman, has touched on the issue of land administration and the land planning program, bringing together the three legs that we have in our department in trying to assist, particularly in rural spaces, uh, to deal with land administration issues holistically. Uh, I think on the issue of land use management, Honorable Kappa, I think that is where our hands are tied. Uh, the courts were clear that land use management remains a municipal competency. So we can provide guidance, we can monitor, we can support, but the actual management of the land within a municipality uh, is done through your spatial development frameworks and your land use schemes that are passed by, approved by the municipal council. Uh, then quickly, and I'm wrapping up, Chair, uh, in terms of honorable, uh, and just to give a reassurance and the assurance that we are definitely monitoring the implementation of SPLUBA. We do this regularly. We update our information on a quarterly basis. The information that was shared today uh, and in the presentation was uh, up to date up to the end of February. So we have a system that we are now updating to ensure that we have uh, almost live information uh, from municipalities. We're not there yet, but we ensure that our uh, information is updated on a regular basis. And we do this uh, through our provincial offices, working together with provinces and, in most cases, the, the Selga offices in, in that particular province. Uh, I think the issue of traditional leaders, we have definitely uh, spoken a lot about it. And it's an area that we are definitely focusing on. In terms of ensuring planning ahead, just to also share that when a municipality develops and passes a, a spatial development framework, uh, that plan and the importance of a spatial development framework is that it introduces longer term planning. So you have a spatial development framework that looks at planning for a period of between 20 to 30 years. So you're not restricted now to that five-year IDP cycle. So your IDP now becomes an instrument that you use to implement the proposals that you have in your spatial development framework. So, so I think as the system is maturing, we're now seeing that the SDFs, and that is what we want to now assess is, what is the impact of that planning and we are currently busy with a project uh, and hopefully we can share it when we're done with uh, the portfolio committee uh, on the impact of spatial development frameworks on spatial transformation. So we have a group of academics that are looking at a sample of uh, spatial development frameworks uh, and what the impact has been on spatial transformation. Similar to the work that uh, Selga has done, but with a different focus on uh, the more the policy legislation aspects. Uh, Honorable Chair, I think uh, on your questions, uh, I think we've spoken a lot about the spatial transformation. And I think what is important, Honorable Chair, on spatial transformation challenges is that we've never had what we now have in terms of a national spatial development framework. Uh, it was recently passed, we're working on unpacking implementation uh, and in the document itself, it talks about the first year or so, it's more about ensuring that it's, uh, we embed and communicate around. And that's the work that we're busy with around the NSDF. What is important about the NSDF is that it identifies 
13 particular spaces in the country that require particular interventions to deal with uh, spatial transformation issues. But importantly, that document is now a guide to provinces and local government to ensure that they take it down into their own levels of spatial development frameworks. And, and I think going forward, uh, we're definitely going to start improving in terms of spatial transformation. I think some of the discussions that our colleagues in Salga are having are also important, particularly with the Department of Human Settlements uh, around spatial trans and the role that uh, housing provision plays in that. I think those are ongoing discussions. Uh, in terms of Section 11 and the municipal differentiation, uh, indeed, I think if you look at the municipalities that we are supporting honorable chair, uh, are those that are in need. So Section 11 allows you to then make differentiated uh, responses to different categories of municipalities based on their capacity, financial constraints. And I think that's the way we are moving. I think in terms of Section 36, uh, Honorable Chair, I did indicate that there has been two uh, legal matters around that particular clause. Uh, but I think the intent uh, was that we leave the decision making to uh, technical people uh, and uh, what the act provides for in the composition of a municipal planning tribunal is that you have the requisite skills. Even if you don't have it in the municipality, you then bring in, for example, your engineers, your environmentalists, so that when that municipal planning tribunal takes a decision on a land use matter, you have the input of the relevant professionals into that. And, and I think it's it's working well uh, across the country. There are spaces where, as I've indicated, uh, due to budgetary constraints, you don't get uh, those MPTs uh, established in time. But where we can support, we are definitely uh, supporting. Uh, I think on the issue of uh, SLAs, I think I've spoken to that Honorable Chair about the restrictions around uh, the constitutional framework and uh, the powers of traditional uh, leaders. Uh, the SLA is there as a mechanism to ensure that traditional leaders are better included. But I think beyond the SLA, there are other ways that we are now trying to get, uh, and I think uh, DDG Hyman touched on that. Uh, in terms of the relationship between the PD Alpha and the Spluma, and this is my last input, uh, we have definitely worked closely with our colleagues, uh, Honorable Chair, and I want to give you that reassurance or assurance, sorry that during the development of the PDL, we've, we've engaged with colleagues. But just a quick example of the relationship between the PDL and the Spluma. So PDL is a, a, it's a, a legislation that is uh, on a national competency. So minister has the powers in terms of the PDL. The Spluma, and in particular, decision-making on land development applications, which I have continuously emphasized during this presentation, is that land decision, land use decision-making lies with the municipality. So if you, for example, want to uh, subdivide a piece of agricultural land, as part of that application process, a municipality will require approval from the minister in terms of the PDL, uh, where the minister says, yes, you can subdivide the land or no, you cannot subdivide the land. And I'm using that as a simple example. So the municipality will then consider the, uh, the, the outcome of that particular application as it processes the land development application. So if minister says no, the municipality is likely to say no because minister is protecting that high value agricultural land. So in taking that decision, the municipality and the municipal planning tribunal in particular must take into cognizance the outcome of uh, the application to the minister for the subdivision of agricultural land. But the actual subdivision 
uh, application and approval happens at in a municipal space. Chair, I think I've covered most of the questions and added to Didi Jaiman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. That is the responses from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. We'll now take responses from Salga. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, my name also is now George Masahel, the chairperson of Rural Development and Special Planning at Salga. I will touch only on few, then the, the rest the team will, will come. Chair, we, 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 we as Salga, we are happy that Spluma strengthen local government, uh, powers to direct planning at the local level, post-democratic transition. We're also happy that some municipalities are trying to level best as they can under some very difficult circumstances try to push the agenda on uh, Spluma implementation. On the, on the concerns that I raised also, Chair, I want to take uh, one in summary about the enforcement capacity to direct development. Currently, development is still dictated by business and people locating where they shouldn't. And we have raised this point, uh, uh, Chair. Um, we need to strengthen capacity and skills working together with the department and planning professional body. Uh, three, misalignment of instruments such as municipal plans with those of other spheres and sectors of government. And about confusion regarding the position of traditional leadership, we hope the MOU that we have signed will help us clarify the concerns and work together as Salga. And as Salga, we are happy that Spluma strengthen local government powers to direct planning at the local level. So this is a few that I can put to you and I will request the Zano and, and Dade Kate to come on board. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, uh, Honorable Mandela and Chairperson Working Group. Um, I think I think the department, as reinforced by uh, the South chairperson, have responded to most of the issues. Um, I'll take uh, uh, two um, areas of emphasis, and my colleague Zano Paolo would would deal with the others. There's a specific uh, question. Uh, directed to us by Honorable Clapper, um, is, is, is are we winning? Uh, as I said, the department has responded to that. It's a slow and complex win, but it is. Um, one of the biggest, most stubborn legacy of apartheid was separate development, and that separate development being enforced by very intentional policies and laws, and the, even the laws themselves fragmenting across the country. Now we have one uniform system uh, to regulate uh, uh, development. Uh, I think that itself is a significant milestone in dismantling this, which I am characterizing as one of the most stubborn legacies. Post the law being passed, uh, there was then a period to ensure that we put the necessary systems, including the institutional mechanisms, to enable us to drive it. It took a while. Um, uh, many municipalities struggled to comply even with some of the most basic requirements, including building that capacity for a number of reasons, uh, such as financial capability, sometimes planners and other technical skills 
refusing to go and work in deep rural areas, etc. We are at a point where the bulk of the municipalities meet those minimum requirements. Quite a telling uh, comment uh, or question that the Honourable Member is asking is, um, are the objectives then met? So it is one thing to comply, which I think we are happy with. Um, the objectives of spatial justice, spatial integration, spatial transformation, which are at the core of the law, uh, those are going to take a while to achieve. Um, again, for a range of complex reasons, which include economics, the economics of land, uh, power dynamics between those who have the money and those who must make the decision for compliance reasons and so on, um, and other underlying issues that then come into play once you have those uh, economics and power dynamics. But to the extent that at least the instrument then is there, once we're able to overcome that, once we build the necessary capacity, uh, I think the few steps and the few examples that my colleagues Anna Paolo meant, made reference to and where uh, my chairperson is also alluding to the instances where some municipalities are trying, as reflected in the presentations, we will continue to build uh, to build on those. It's going to be a long process. I think we need to put our cards on the table and uh, and continue to jointly monitor that progress and 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 open ourselves to be held accountable, to hold each other accountable, to ensure that the intended outcomes do indeed come slow as they are, but they must indeed come. and and, and we are open. We are open to that. Um, uh, part of those, I think, to some extent, you know, the chairperson, Councillor Masafella, made reference um, about how well or not we are supporting the municipalities in their applications, and a specific example being made about malls being built in places where they uh, they shouldn't. I would even add to that questions: people locating. Uh, houses, uh, formal and informal within flat plains and the downstream challenges that we've seen uh, in the public domain, in the news and other uh, instances. Uh, that then also re relates to the enforcement capacity. We know what needs to be done. It's Bluma is there, the land use management schemes uh, are there. Um, now, the enforcement uh, when we need to remove people from where they shouldn't be, uh, we then encounter certain difficulties. Maybe one of my last points uh, links to the alignment of instruments, as the chairperson, my, my Councillor Masakada, indicated. On the one hand, um, you know that people should not be in the flat plain. They have built their shacks there. The municipality comes and tries to uh, remove. It becomes a difficult process, legally, politically, economically. Um, now, part of the instruments that we say sometimes are misaligned. When we remove uh, people that are located in places that should not be in terms of the, uh, the land use schemes. From a process point of view, um, we've then often been taken to task in the courts uh, through other pieces of law. And those pieces of law then require municipalities, for example, to house um, uh, those that uh, that have been relocated. When the municipality does not have the necessary funding mechanisms to to do so, uh, then then it becomes a dead end. So if we are able to align all the different instruments, in this instance, Luba, Pi Act, uh, Prevention of Illegal Eviction Act, uh, the fiscal instruments, uh, the finances to house. Uh, people that are in in trouble uh, that are vulnerable 
if we're able to align all these different instruments, I think it then takes us places us in a better position to get to the intended objectives, including mitigating the kind of risks uh, that uh, that have been identified. The the monitoring, I think, has been spoken to. Uh, whether there is a role for DPME to play, I think it's something we can continue to reflect on. Uh, between ourselves as partners, we certainly work very well with Dalrabs uh, in the monitoring of Spuma. We work well with DPME on other programs, whether there is triangulation or joint monitoring that can be done there. Uh, it's it's a conversation we can have. On our side, we're quite happy with, <coughs> with the monitoring. Um, and if I cross-reference that with a point that was made, it was not directed at us, I think it was directed at the department. But in that monitoring, we've been able to identify specific sets of issues that each of the individual municipalities are grappling with. And on the basis of that, we have then been able to target specific uh, municipalities to address their specific concerns in order to then avoid one-size-fits-all interventions, which may be appropriate in some areas and not appropriate in others. And it is that that has then informed the number of municipalities that have been supported by a combination of partners. Some of them have been supported by SAUGA, some of them have been supported directly by the department. In other instances, we have COPTA. In other instances, we have uh, uh, offices of the premiers. So, so each of us as the collective uh, then draw from that monitoring report that is driven by the by the department direct to then direct uh, the set the sets of interventions. Um, I think those that were directed at us. Um, I would like to leave it at that. Um, uh, through you, Chairperson, um, can I check if there's anything that we have left out between Councillor Masafella and myself? And if there is, uh, maybe my colleagues and colleague can respond uh, in the last instance. Thank you. Thank you. And a quick one. Um, I think on whether we are winning, as Puma, you've indicated that. Um, has the object the objective of Spruma been achieved? Um, not yet, but we still have a long way to go. Um, as the barometer report indicates, there remains a problem for special segregation and exclusion. And there are suggestions that we specifically make to deal with that um, 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 in our report, um, including um, reorientation of the municipal spatial development frameworks and integrated development plans, um, the next cycle, to take into account these issues, to strengthening and reorientation of the management of spatial transformation at a municipal institutional level. Um, indeed, Spluma is an instrument that still provides um, a helpful guide to achieve that, um, despite the slow start, um, particularly in the first two years from 2015. What has been the success for the IGR coordination that we've engaged on? Um, I think the biggest has been to respond to the concern that has been repeated in our national engagement platform. And that concern is around two things. One, the relationship between municipal council and its spluma provided structures like MPTs and AAs and the customary role of traditional leadership on matters concerning um, land development, the roles given by spluma and the roles given to the customary role of um, 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 our traditional institutions the adoption of the framework last year to enable conflict resolution is a step in the right direction. It is too early, Chairperson, to at this stage um, 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 take a decisive yes or no on whether it is working. But I think the appetite, if we assess by attitudes in the tone of the engagement, in the meetings and the dialogues that we've been having, is an encouraging one, and we want to continue with that. The second one is the adoption by all municipalities. We are at least in the in the late 90s by the reports that we just had from the department of wall-to-wall -wall land use schemes 
that are consistent with Section 24, which also take into account two important aspects, particularly that deal with the um, objective and imperative of special transformation, the partner considerations, as well as the alignment between the different roles and their role players. We are happy um, that the norms and standards provide further instrument through the proposal for agency agreements. However, there are things that we still need to make sure that um, they are corrected and I'll respond to the question by the chair later. Um, there is the second one in relation to this question of what has been the success. There is improved coherence in the manner in which municipal support um, on spatial planning and spluma is being implemented, which has been improved largely by the change of approach between ourselves, the National Department of um, 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 Agriculture and Rural Development, as well as our municipalities. We have started to at least make an impact on silo planning and silo service delivery by sitting in the same sessions and sharing the same sessions of planning as well as and prioritization for support to municipalities. I think the structures such as the forums, as well as the other dialogue structures that we've set up are a good um, sign that we are on the right track with regards to improving coherence in the manner in which we deliver a combined municipal support and also maximize the impact of the limited resource in the hands of the state. Um, there is, however, a concern at an IGR level, and that concern is around the difficulties that are operational, which have led to a number of potential sittings of an important IGR structure that deals with land reform not being able to meet as regularly as we would have loved, because a number of important land reform matters are not processed if those meetings are missed. And I refer to the IMC on land, um, which has not been able to meet as regularly as we would like because of difficulties in diary problems of the participants. Um, are traditional leaders involved in land use schemes and land use management processes of municipalities? Not, it would be, it would be a lie if we say to an optimal level, definitely not to an optimal level. And we are, this is, this is, this is one area that we have identified as a clear area of intervention that needs to be strengthened. One of the ways of strengthening it would be to bring clear clauses that support IGR and, 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 and deliberate IGR um, inputs um, in the value chain of um, decision-making on land development matters as part of the Spluma amendment processes. And there was a question that was asked, what exactly are these concerns? One of them is the concern around exclusion. There are certain clauses that unintentionally um, placed in the, in the regulations that have resulted into strengthening the concerns about exclusion or not being able to get a space to contribute or participate. E.g., you've mentioned, Chairperson, <clears throat> for example, the, 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 the sections that um, exclude participation of a public representative, which is a councillor in a context, or a serving member of a traditional council in structures like MPTs. And I think these are some of the things that we've identified as part of the problem statement that we want to resolve through the amendment of school minds and, and, and supporting regulations. How are we addressing issues of informality? Um, one of them is around strengthening the revision of land use schemes to ensure that in all our municipalities, they are one to one. Um, so that they are able to deal with policy and supporting framework for decisions to ensure that there is intentional spatial transformation and there's also agility and efficiency that is introduced in our processes of um, deciding on land development and applications um, for, for land development in our municipalities. The second one is development of support tools, which we have um, put together um, that we need to combine and continue to um, um, extend to municipalities and extend to stakeholders that work with municipalities, including the traditional institutions. And these tools are tools that particularly impact on 
informality arising or increasing as a result of unlawful land occupation. Informality that is informed or impacting on unlawful development and that is speculative, that is resulting from speculative and unregulated um, developments which have no connection or compliance with ruling municipal land use schemes or um, policies of the municipalities to manage um, and, and that. Um, updating of the valuation role um, as part of the Municipal Rates Act requirements, that takes into account the SPLUMA and the Special Development Framework imperatives. And those imperatives are particularly imperatives that are on just transition, as well as ensuring redistribution and fair distribution of resources to cater to all areas in a municipal area, including provision of services to areas that are jointly administered as communal areas and rural areas. Inclusion of the, 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 the third one is inclusion of spatial transformation indicators in municipal planning and budgeting processes so that there is fair distribution and there is clear intent to support service delivery to especially rural and communally administered areas. And lastly, implementation of a framework to facilitate effective contracting that arise from the provisions of the recently gazetted SPLUMA norms and standards on agency agreement so that there is a standardized way of entering into this and monitoring the effectiveness of um, these relationships. Taking into account, Chairperson, the comment that you made, and I agree with it, that we may need to look at the unintentional potential risk of introducing through a mechanism of norms and standards a possible usurping of a power that the primary law or the primary act has actually identified the authority. And I think it is something that we will work together um, 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 with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our department to look at um, those things and we will also seek proper legal counseling on those areas before we create um, 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 a challenge for our system as a whole. Um, how can MPTs be improved to be more functional and effective? The first one is the opportunity that is been placed in front of us by the amendment of the regulations um, on SPLUMA, which we are working together. And I think we are going to deal with those issues of exclusion um, and, and through the amendments that we got. And secondly, that we are busy doing. Secondly, we have already tested the waters chairperson by taking in certain provinces like Limpombo, Free State, and partly Eastern Cape, um, inclusion of participation of um, representatives of um, 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 traditional institutions in the decision-making structures um, that are put together through SCRUMA using and the scope that is available there in the guidelines um, um, of, the, of, the, of the regulations. Um, this is something that I think can be strengthened it, if it could be clarified and be made very clear in terms of the um, um, amended regulations um, um, and once we get to that level. Incorporation of project uh, considerations um, that guide the processes of development and approval of development applications by municipalities and also capacitation of MPTs, which targets capacity building and strategic reorientation of the functionality of these structures to also deal with the imperative of special development, to deal with the imperatives of red tape reduction, which deals with the indicator that we've indicated in a special transformation parameter on economy and, and mobility and rational decision making, which takes into account sound understanding of the context in which these decisions are happening, where, for example, there is a constitutionally provided for role of customary, involved, customary leadership involvement in land development matters. So we need to be able to then provide a reorientation capacity building in our MPTs that takes into account a rational decision-making process and tools to support that process. Thank you, Chair. Oh, Chair, the last one 
is on the um, 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 impact of the decision that has just been made through the approval of the amendments of the Agricultural Act of 1970. We do take note, Chairperson, of the um, advice that you provide us, and it is an advice that we've already started to create operational engagement processes to deal with it. There needs to be a clear alignment of the authorization and the management of the interface between the provisions created under the amended act of agricultural um, um, agricultural land of 1970 and Luma as it relates to land use management because there is a potential risk in the roles that have been created in those two legislations if we don't manage them very well. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, honorable members. There's, there's responses from uh, the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development, as well as uh, from Salga on the uh, questions that you have posed regarding Spluma. Are there any follow-up questions, honorable members? See no show of hands. If uh, that be, there is no uh, follow up questions. It brings us, honorable members, to the end of our items on the agenda we had today. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank uh, the executive in the Ministry of the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development as led by Mama Utiteza, the Deputy Ministers and the officials of the department uh, who presented uh, the uh, presentation of Spluma. We are grateful that you have come and appeared before the committee and be able to share your input uh, on this, and we appreciate the uh, responses that you afforded uh, to honorable members. would like to also take this opportunity to thank uh, the delegation and leadership of SALGA for having come before the Portfolio Committee and presented also their presentation on Spluma and afforded us responses in that uh, regard, uh, which were posed by the honorable members. Honorable members, allow me to uh, thank you for having been able to uh, attend the uh, session and be able to, uh, as always, uh, engage robustly with uh, the presentations that have been put before the committee. I want to take a moment to also thank our uh, staff uh, who continuously work in the background to ensure that we are able to have these uh, successful uh, virtual meetings. Therefore, I want to thank our uh, secretariat, our content advisors, the researchers, as well as uh, those that attend uh, to logistics and uh, the IT in particular and communications. Uh, we want to thank all uh, our guests that were able to attend the session. Honorable members, we do have a plenary this afternoon at two o'clock. We wish you well with the rest of uh, the day and have a great week ahead. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Signing out from you, Santiago in Chile. Bye.